I have my teeth prisons back in. I don't like them, but it's okay. Teeth prison. <laughs> teeth prison. <laughs> That's totally Saturday morning cartoon I would watch. Teeth prison? Teeth prison. <laughs> teeth prison. Got the molars trying to escape from the teeth, teeth prison. prison. Watch don't let the wizard ones get away. Teeth prison. Teeth oh prison. no, braces. Right. Teeth prison, they're clear, but you can't leave. It's like a weird force field thing, and you teeth brush your prison. teeth as Andrea's dance into the song about teeth and the prisons that we keep them in. Okay. Teeth prison! <laughs> What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. Every Friday, I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Christine Steimer. Hello. And Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. <laughs> We're laughing because uh, another fantastic Steimer song happened just before the start of this video. And maybe if you're lucky, you caught it on the YouTube uh, at uh, <laughs> youtube.com slash what's good games. Um, you can I, only hope. Yeah, right. Before we um, get into the show, I also had a surprise I wanted to show you. I showed Brittany before Steimer logged on for our call tonight. But Steimer... He, Da, 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 da. Oh my god. Oh, he's so cute. Isn't he cute? It's, it's I an like adorable his overalls. Arctic seal and like what are those pla what's that plastic material? Oh, it's like vinyl or like something. Vinyl. vinyl yellow overalls. And I told Andrea he looks like a Henry. He kind of does look he like does a Henry. Kind of, yeah. He's I so wish cute. he had a little hat. Can we I make know. him a hat? Okay, we'll have to find him a hat. So for uh, okay. all of our audio listeners, um, I just showed this adorable little stuffed seal who's wearing yellow like almost like a raincoat material overalls yeah, he's got yeah. these little shoes on so john got me an official seal bando for the wgg studio and now Brittany has dubbed him henry henry the a husband henry the husbando yeah <laughs> I, I like the alliteration play, i wanted to play careless whisper but then i knew that's not good for the podcast so i didn't it's true it's true that content id that bam ban that. hammer will come right on down um but uh welcome to the show everybody whether it is episode one or episode 117 we're glad that you're here we're gonna talk about video games and boy oh boy has it been a doozy of a news week um since the last time the podcast aired we have a ton of stuff to talk about but before we get to that we We've got some announcements because at the end of the month, we're going to Seattle. It's going to be a fantastic time at PAX West. Yes, the Penny Arcade Expo happening up there at the Washington State Convention Center. We've got a lot of things to talk about now because the PAX West schedule is officially live. So, Brittany, <laughs> why don't you kick us off with what What's Good Games is doing at PAX West? At PAX West, we have our meetup, which we can say is now Friday, August 30th from 7 to 10 p.m. The location will be announced soon. It's going to be great. Who knows? By the time this podcast airs, maybe we've actually announced it. I don't Who know if you'll say? be so lucky. Who could say? No one knows. And then on Sunday, September 1st at 9 p.m., we're going to have our panel, What's Good Games Live? What are we going to talk about? Probably the stuff we've been playing. But other than that, we haven't thought about it, nor will we think about it. We're just going to show up and do our best. That's anyway. what we do every day. It is what we, yeah, true, yeah. And that'll be live streamed. So if you can't be there in person, we'll only judge you slightly, but you can watch us live. Yes, and we great. will have the exact link once uh, we get a bit closer to PAX. But we will be in the Hydra Theater for those of you that are going to be Absolutely. at the show. Uh, and we hope to see all of your shiny, beautiful faces there on Sunday night. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple other cool things happening. I'm hosting a couple panels, which I announced this week on Twitter and, uh, and, and Facebook and Instagram and the like. So you may have remembered that I've done several panels with Square Enix and the Life is Strange family, both with Don't Nod and with Deck Nine, the two developers who work on the franchise. And we are back for another Life is Strange panel happening Friday at 12 p.m. Pacific time. And the name of that panel is Life is Strange, bringing relatable characters and stories to life. Join Michelle Koch, the co-creative director of Life is Strange 2, and the voiceover cast of the game for an exclusive in-depth discussion where you will discover the stories behind the performances and behind the scenes, secrets of the research involved in creating the relatable characters, grounded settings, and extraordinary events that define Life is Strange. The panel will be moderated by one Andrea Renee. That's me. Who's that? Uh, Co-founder of What's Good Games. So, hope you guys come on by the Raven Theater. That is at 12 p.m. 
p.m. on Friday. Of course, that's ahead of our fantastic event that we're doing for What's Good Games. And then on Saturday... At 1.30 p.m., I'm going to be hosting another panel for Private Division and Obsidian Entertainment for The Outer Worlds called Bringing the Characters of the Outer Worlds to Life. Obsidian Entertainment has a long history of building narratively compelling worlds and characters for its RPGs, and that style of writing is on full display in The Outer Worlds. Megan Starks, the senior narrative designer, Carrie Patel, who we interviewed, senior narrative designer, and Kate Dollarhide, this narrative designer, break down what it means to create characters for the game from how they should fit into the world and what their personality should be how they should interact with other characters and how to give them life with a performance moderated by andrea renee that's me this panel will explore how obsidian entertainment writers go about bringing their characters to life and will show off an exclusive look did you hear that exclusive look at what players can expect to see and do when obsidian entertainment and private division release the outer worlds on october 25th so again that is at 1 30 p.m on saturday in the raven theater uh, just like uh, yeah. the, like the strange panel is on Friday. So hopefully you guys come by. Uh, it should be a good time. I want to make a note. I think it's really badass that everybody on that panel is a lady dev. Well, except for me. I'm I'm just moderating. But but you're a lady. I you're am a regular lady. old lady. You're a regular old lady. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> but that, just your like, your run yeah. of the mill lady. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm very excited. Um, but That's yeah, really PAX cool. is going to be great. Um, we're pumped. And we did move the dates of our Patreon live streams, though. Did we talk about that? No. 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 But we can now. We have okay. not, now. Yeah. Good segue. So Let's originally, go. they were going to be Wednesday, August 28th from Mikasa. But some things, you know, some things happen. And sometimes you have to rearrange your plan. So now they're going to be Thursday, August 29th. Time, we picked a time before we went live, but I, I don't believe re- the, the pencil in time is 5 p.m. Pacific for the happy hour QA and 6 30 p.m. Pacific for the after hour stream. Now, those aren't set in stone, but we are going to do our best to adhere to something very close to that. Uh, we'll be flying in that day, Steimer and I will. And so, cross your fingers, the travel gods are good to us and we don't have to delay the streams, but <laughs> that's the uh, that's the plan, friendos. That's the plan. The plan. Speaking of Patreon, a big shout out and thank you to this month's Patreon producers, Alex Rogopoulos, Farah Sate, Mohammed Mohammed, and David Ikelucci. And you guys, we got a nice healthy chunk of brand new folks that are in the Patreon community at patreon.com slash what's good games. This week, we welcome Kenneth Kopnick, Josh Earl, Christian Puente, Tony Tran, Matthew D. Clemens, Sean Hadra. Hajra? Hundra? 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 Sean, I'm sorry. I, I messed up your name. Chris Collins. Kara. Kara? Kara? Don't know. You'll have to let us know. Uh, is this Kike? 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 Cardone. <laughs> Fabian do Martinez. Know. Sydney Sullivan. Crater. Isis Roberts. Patches Plays. Solana Sanchez. Kelsey Anderson. And Hunter Big are all brand new members of our Patreon community. Again, if you guys want to join for exclusive vlogs, streams, and all kinds of fun shenanigans, patreon.com slash what's good games. I did our kind of uh, farewell vlog showing off the studio here in San Francisco last week. So if you guys want to check that out, um, it is uh, an exclusive video just on Patreon. Yeah. Yeah, all yeah, right. yeah. I think now that the announcements are finished, unless I forgot something. Ah. Uh... Uh-uh. Covered no, I think it. I it. Uh, it's time to get into the news. But before we do that, I have to tell you it's brought to you by Fleur. Now, we all know scent is closely linked to memory. And I feel like when it comes to some of our favorite summer memories, that's definitely the case. For example, whenever I smell fresh cut grass, I'm transported back to summers in Fargo where I mowed lawns for a couple of bucks. Or when Britt smells summer, she thinks of playing video games mm. in my room. With all the curtains drawn, because I'm a fucking recluse. So is that like a musty smell? What is that? It got smell very like? musty. Yeah, one time my uh, my best friend was over. <laughs> my very <and> own musk. <laughs> we were playing a uh, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance on PS2, and it was a weekend thing. And my mom runs in. She's like, "You girls stink!" And she ran and she opened the blinds. She opened all the windows. She febrezed the sh out of everything. So yeah, it got very musty. Wow. Well, if you don't we want to stink like Brit, I guess. 
This is the you perfect. Smell good like me. This is the perfect <laughs> message for you. You can create some special summer memories that involve smelling delicious like Steimer with the perfect fragrance from Fleur. That's P H L U R. Now we've told you guys how great Steimer smells and the Ciano scent from Fleur, including how we sometimes linger a little too long smelling her and how delicious she is. But now I think I'm hooked on Haname which is another one of their sets. It's soft, it's clean, and it has smells with notes of fig, white florals, hazelnut, and sandalwood. What are those smells you might not recognize? I don't really either, but apparently that's what the really fancy folks at Fleur who know everything about scents have told me that it smells like. What I like, and my favorite part, is that it's incredibly light. It doesn't linger too long, so if I want to switch scents to something else, like maybe like Ameline, like throughout the day, I can. Fleur makes great smelling, clean, and sustainable fragrances for everybody because all that matters is what you like. And unlike other fragrance companies, Fleur is transparent and discloses every ingredient and why it's in there. That's important. You guys can make your own scent memories with Fleur. Go to phlur.com today and use promo code What's Good to get 20% off your first custom Fleur sample set. Pick three scents to try and get credit towards a full size bottle of your favorite. That's promo code What's Good at phlur.com to get your first three Fleur fragrance samples at 20% off. Fleur.com, promo code What's Good. So when I said this was a busy week and there's a lot of news, I wasn't kidding. So let's start with loot boxes, shall we? Everyone's favorite topic to talk about in video game news. And oh boy. <laughs> this time, though, at least it looks like maybe there's a step in the right direction when we're having this loot box conversation. So you guys may have heard uh, about a week ago or so, the government of the United States mentioned that they were going to be having a seminar slash panel, um, some kind of a retreat. <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it about the video game business and a how summit. a summit. That's the word. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were going to have multiple people speaking at this summit discussing the video game industry and how it relates to microtransactions and loot boxes. And I actually thought that it was a really smart move in the right direction to open dialogue, to have some back and forth about it and really let people hear from some of the industry ex experts about what these are, how they affect people, and what, if any, steps that the industry needs to take. Because I think these kinds of summits are the best way to stave off potential legislation being enacted to say, hey, let's talk about how we can avoid passing laws and instead you fix the behavior that we want to see you fix. So as a result of that, and I don't have, um, it was happening today, the day that we're shooting, and so I don't have um, the full uh, summary of everything that happened um, at the White House, but what we do have is a story from Brendan Sinclair at gamesindustry.biz with a headline, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft to require loot box odds dis disclosure. So this is kind of a doozy of a story. I'm going to try to truncate where I can. The Entertainment Software Association has said that Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft are working on new policies to require loot box odds disclosure on their systems. Entertainment Software Association Chief Counsel of Tech Policy Michael Warnecke announced the news this morning at the Federal Trade Commission's Inside the Game workshop on the loot box issue. The comments came after Warnecke recapped the industry's previous attempts to address loot box concerns and in-game purchases labels on retail titles and platform-level spending controls on consoles and the EA Origin PC storefront quote that said we are doing more said warnecke i'm pleased to announce and i'm just guessing on how to pronounce his last name but based off how it's spelled That's i apologize if it's wrong <laughs> i'm pleased to announce that this morning that microsoft nintendo and sony have indicated to esa a commitment to new platform policies with respect to the use of paid loot boxes in games that are developed for their platform specifically this would apply to new games and game updates that add loot box features and it would require the disclosure of the relative rarity or probabilities of obtaining randomized virtual items in games that are available on their platforms as well as many of the leading video game publishers of the ESA have decided that they are going to implement a similar approach at the publisher level to provide consumers this information and give them enhanced information to make purchase decisions end quote 
Apple mandated loot box odds disclosure for iOS games back in 2017, and Google followed suit with Google Play requirements earlier this year. And there's an update to the story. The ESA has provided more details on these loot box disclosures, saying that the platform holders are targeted to implement them in 2020. Excuse me, targeting to implement them in 2020. The trade group released a list of its member companies that have pledged to release loot box disclosures odds on all new games by the end of 2020. And that list includes... Activision Blizzard, Bandai Namco Entertainment, Bethesda, Bungie, Electronic Arts, Microsoft, Nintendo, Sony Interactive Entertainment, Take-Two Interactive, Ubisoft, Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment, and Wizards of the Coast. That is a monster list, and I'm glad to hear that all of the major publishers are on that list. Now, here's a list of some of the other smaller but still big publishers that have not made such a commitment. That includes 505 Games, Capcom, CI Games, Deep Silver, Disney Interactive Studios, Epic Games, Folks Home Interactive, Gearbox Publishing, Gung Ho, Intellivision Entertainment, Calypso, Konami, Magic Leap, NCSoft, Natsume, Nexon, Rebellion, Riot Games is really the big guy there, Sega, Square Enix, THQ Nordic, actually Square Enix is a big one too, Tencent, and Marvelous. So... I think what's interesting to note about this secondary list is that many of these people actually work with other publishers. And so it's possible that if this decision was being handed down, it wouldn't be handed down by them. Deep Silver, for example, under the Coke Media umbrella. And so they might not be the ones to say, we're doing this. It's their parent company that would be the one. So um, I hope that some of these companies, or all of these companies really, um, join the first list of saying, yes. We can all put our probabilities, but if I think about a company like Konami, for example, at least the games that they publish here in North America, I don't instantly think, oh yeah, their games have a ton of microtransactions. So I, maybe it's possible that when this was decided, their legal teams just hadn't scrambled to get their, um, their statement in yet, but hopefully they will. Come on, Capcom. The first time I... Come on, Capcom. I believe in you. Yeah. <laughs> Give us those Resident Evil loot boxes. I mean, I would pay way too much money. Anyway, it's fine. <laughs> so the first time I the first time I read this, I was a little confused because the quote from Warnicky, or however you say your name, yeah. says, I'm pleased to announce this morning that Microsoft, Nintendo, and Sony have indicated to ESA a commitment to new platform policies with respect to the use of paid loot boxes in games that are developed for their platform. So what I thought that meant is that those three were implementing a policy is that if you want to develop games for our platform, you have to give these this information out, right? That, that is what but it so, means. So then why would it matter whether or not these other companies pledge to do it? Cause because like, where else not everybody publishes, publishes on, on those, those platforms. platforms, right? With the exception of Nintendo, all of these other publishers publish on PC as well. And they also, uh, several of them also publish on mobile. Um, though, as we stated, iOS and Google Play as mobile stores specifically require it. But there are other mobile stores that you can buy games from, though not not really. Most people buy just from those two. Um, but yeah, PC is really like the big wild card here. Okay. So if these companies, okay, I'm working through my brain here. So if these companies did not pledge to do this. What they were essentially saying is, well, we might just release our game on PC without indicating the loot box drop that's, rates. That's not necessarily what not having made a commitment means. It could just mean that they, like Andrea said, didn't have company like, affirmation at the time like it, honestly like it doesn't necessarily mean like no fuck you it just might mean we were a little slow or we aren't sure or we need to check with somebody else like she said there may be a parent company um so it could just be stuff like that we don't really know exactly what it okay because i was thinking to. yeah if all three of them are saying like yo you have to do this then it's like well then of course these people are gonna not not publish because these are the only consoles out there so i was like it's kind of, maybe it's more of like a formality like look at us good guys yeah. But, uh, well, I mean, that's really what you need, though, right? You need the platform yeah. holders to hold their feet mm -hmm. to the fire, especially with a company like Epic Games not joining that group that's made a commitment and them having the biggest game in the world right now with Fortnite, which has loot boxes in it, right? Um, I think that what they need to do is hopefully get their ducks in a row as quickly as possible to say, of course, we stand with the likes of Sony Interactive Entertainment and Microsoft and Activision and, and Electronic Arts to say, you know, we will absolutely be part of this coalition that's going to publish these drop rates. Now, and I know that for some people out there, this is like, 
maybe too little too late or it's just like not not good enough and they want more but i think like when it comes to getting gigantic corporations to agree to something this is a gigantic step <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah definitely it's good and similar to what you were saying like the fact that apple already does this and google does this probably helped mm -hmm. because it's kind of like well if those other larger companies are doing it there's no reason why our store funds shouldn't uh and then you know Push you know, them, push them all in the right direction. Yes. Fortnite no longer has the random loot boxes, though, right? Now, I think they got rid of it because the big deal of Psyonix getting rid of loot boxes in Rocket League is that's, like, the method that they're going. That was for the Save the World portion of Fortnite, I believe. I actually... I'm looking at this story a, from... That's a good question that I don't Epic know Epic Games. I, go yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'm no, 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 yeah. go ahead. Yeah, 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 save the world mode, usual daily randomized offering of V-Bucks Llama. Yeah, so maybe it is just save the world. Fortnite's more popular battle royale mode does not use paid randomized loot boxes. There you go. Okay, so there you go. So yeah, no, 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 that's cool. But, because I, because, but yeah, obviously with Rocket League getting rid of their loot boxes, I was like, well, they, Fortnite doesn't have them, but still, this is great. This is good news, friends. This is what we've been wanting. Yeah. Not everyone's happy with this, though. No, of course not. Why? Why, I mean, it why, is why a, would it there is be a small step? But I do think, like you said, the fact that these corporations came together at all and are able to make these kind of decisions, it's a very it's a very healthy step for the industry in general, not even just for loot boxes. But it's always good whenever there can be a consensus consensus like this. Damn, yeah. teeth prisons making words teeth hard. Teeth prison. <laughs> um, so I thought this was interesting. This was something that was posted on gamesindustry.biz as well. And I thought this was interesting because it provides an insight as to what these folks from the director of National Council on Problem Gambling and Consumer Reports Director of Financial Policy, like what they're looking for and what they want in video game loot box regulation, if you will. Um, so I'll just go through this really quick. So I took some notes. So when so what happened was um, ESRB president Patricia Vance came up and she was saying, that, hey, you know, now we have in-game purchases on physical labels. We have loot box disclosures now coming. But then the counter argument, the first one came from Consumer Reports Director Anna Lat Layton. And her presentation cent centered on the argument that the goal of microtransactions in general, including loot boxes, is for people to purchase them and that companies will use subtle tactics tactics to manipulate players into buying more of them and because of this that simply letting consumers know that the purchases exist in a game on their odds isn't enough she's talking about when companies use things like gems instead of real money to buy <laughs> games it kind of distances you from how much money you're actually spending daily login bonuses pay to win and excessive grinding those are her subtle tactics she was talking about and then keith white the exec executive director of the national council on problem gambling he said that Basically, loot boxes are kind of like gambling, and he suggested that while informing consumers about odds disclosure, it's a good first step. It doesn't; it's not enough. He said he suggested changing all games with loot boxes to an M rating for mature. And he said many of the games are mostly concerning were rated as teen. And he said if you're a parent who's basing your parental controls on whether the ESRB rating is T and the ESRB rating is artificially low, that might not trigger the appropriate level of parental control. And then he said that we need a third party regulation because the example he used is that you wouldn't trust a casino to say these odds on our slot machine are 100 percent correct. He said, you know, you need a third party to come in and audit it. So that's something he's pushing for. And then that the are launching that they are launching a website called responsibleplay.org to assist people who are having issues with loot boxes and addiction. And it'll provide questionnaires which will indicate whether or not you have an addiction. And then this I thought this one was interesting. He wants the industry to adopt self-exclusion programs to allow users to know if they have issues to effectively block themselves from making the purchases in games on a particular card or payment account. Obviously, this requires the initiative of the player to you know, say like, I got to block myself from making these purchases. But he said that it falls on those accepting payments to honor these programs and implement them. And then Ariel Johnson, senior counsel for common sense media came up and she was, she's talked about the children. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting because I guess my thought about loot boxes is they don't really affect me in the sense that they can be there and I'm not too tempted by them unless it's something like I really want. And I know like what I'm getting myself into but it's interesting to see folks from outside industries come in and say, these are programs that we've seen help and maybe the industry should implement them as well. 
I think anyway. all of that stuff listed is absolutely gr good things to do. I think yeah. everything that he suggested should be done. Like, yeah, make them all mature rated. Make, you know, people have opportunities to self-diagnose with quizzes and, you know, assets and materials on a website. Let people block them or those purchases. Like, I think that's all good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would love to see, I think auditing is a fantastic thing as well. He makes a very valid point that, you know, you can't necessarily trust, which leads me directly into our next story. Oh uh, boy. The FTC, the FTC panel reveals troubling relationship between streamers and loot box creators. So Charlie Hall over at Polygon wrote this up in a remarkable exchange in Washington this week, the leader of a major management company for YouTube and Twitch celebrities said that a video game publisher has approached his clients to willfully <clears throat> misrepresent how loot boxes work. Omid Dariani, CEO of Online Performers Group, OPG, expressed frustration with online video platforms regarding required disclosures of paid advertisements during live streams. The remarks were made this week and broadcast live during a day-long loot box workshop hosted by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. And Dariani was invited to participate in the first panel of the day as his organization represents dozens of content creators, including um, Angry Joe, who you guys might know and a uh, friend of the show, and Major League Baseball pitcher Trevor May. During a question and answer period, Dariani was asked by the FTC's Brittany Frasetto about the nature of disclosures and his clients must make during their streams. Frasetto asked, based on your expertise, do video game publishers pay these content creators to open loot boxes? Do they pay for the loot boxes? And if so, do they at times give them better odds than the public at large? And how much of that is disclosed? And then Dariani responded, companies do pay for that sort of thing. It's pretty uncommon for it to specifically be, hey, just open a bunch of loot boxes, but we've definitely seen that. I've definitely been in a room where a publisher said we could do better odds on the packs that this person opens for promotional purposes. That's only been one time. Okay, that's bad. That's gross. Uh, Continuing yeah. on. Opening loot boxes live online is a popular pastime for some content creators, and currently the FTC does not require that they disclose that the odds have been tilted in their favor when they do. Wait, what? Wait, 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 can you read that again? <laughs> Sorry, hold on. Currently the FTC does not so require that they disclose that the odds have been tilted in their favor. Oh, wow. This is, if, okay. if that's happened, so like what Dariana said, that's been one time. If that thing actually came to fruition, the FTC currently doesn't have any regulations that would say that that would be bad and they would need to disclose it. Wow. Yes. And obviously this is, this was, I mean, I don't want to go too far down a side, a sidebar here, but this was exactly why those YouTubers got in trouble with their gambling site with Counter-Strike skins a couple of years back where they were making like millions of dollars on these kids and other, other adults watching them open all of these things or kind of bets on these skins well, that was worse, but yeah. It was, yeah, no, that that was like a, a nightmare scenario of non-disclosure. Um, but I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to conflate the two. Uh, so continuing on. Uh, later in the same exchange, Zarian expressed dismay over the inadequacy of platforms like Twitch to enforce stricter disclosure standards. A single live stream may last for hours, and he said that it's cumbersome for hosts to continually remind viewers who might be joining midstream that the content they're watching is sponsored. He expressed surprise that the platforms like Twitch don't already require proactive measures, not unlike age gates, to ensure that sponsorships are made clear before someone elects to tune into a live stream. At the same time, he said that streamers are very proud of their sponsorships and are disinclined to hide them um there's a little bit more in that story about how being a sponsored streamer lends credibility to the streamer to say hey ea paid us to stream apex legends because they think our audience is valuable and they think what we do is valuable and so we absolutely want to disclose that hey ea paid us yo we got that ea money son um and so it's an interesting dynamic i don't know that i agree with that but sure that's that's just what he was that's just i know, I know I'm, yeah. I'm absolutely paraphrasing but you can go no, back and look at his comments about it but it was essentially the idea that some of these streamer streamers are proud of the fact that they get to work with these publishers and these companies on these sponsored streams which of course they are we love working with our sure, sponsors right like square enix has sponsored many what's good games things and we're happy to work with them we would never hide that from you guys in cloaked in shadow yes <laughs> but but what we do is obviously very different than what's happening in this story so i think yeah 
What's interesting about this uh, whole thing is one, it's good that there's conversation about it and that there's some light happening or light being shown on this whole situation. I did not know, <laughs> and maybe that's just me being ignorant. I did not know that this was a thing that happens, that publishers who have loot boxes pay people to open loot boxes and then stack the odds in their favor. That's disgusting. Ew. I don't know that that, I feel like this was conflated maybe a bit because he literally said that's been one time. I right. can't imagine that that's, I don't want people being like, oh my God, every publisher has ever done right. this. No, I agree. Um, and, no and, I, and I would say any paid streams, at least that I have seen in my time throughout multiple companies have been not like specifically you will open loot boxes sometimes loot boxes are gifted like you can here's a pack or whatever do what you want with it you don't necessarily need to open it on stream you can open it in your house by yourself if you want um so like there's a lot of different variations and styles of, of ways you can do this with a streamer and i would think it's pretty fucking rare that it would be i would like to pay you to open this loot box and i'm going to switch the odds so that it looks like it's way more fun um at least, again, in any company that I have worked for, that has ever been the case. And I've worked for a few of the bigger bigger boys out there. You have, indeed. <gasps> yeah. No, it's it's interesting to watch um, kind of this whole loot box thing. It, it, com it comes and goes, right? I mean, Grant, I think there's a story every week we could talk about if we wanted to about loot boxes. But I think, the, like, the big waves. And I, was it last year or the year before when it, it all started? It was with Battlefront, too, right? When all the... the oh, real, Battlefront was, yeah, like, the real the shit. Real, the, the real, the yeah. The child for bad loot boxes, yep. yeah. Yeah, yes. and then for a while, I feel like that's all we were talking about. And then, you know, it got kind of quiet for a bit relatively. And then now we're starting to see... I think relatively quickly, like the change, change happening. And this is just a good step forward. I remember the first kind of funny games daily I hosted with you, Andrea. I don't know what the topic was exactly, but we were talking about uh, loot boxes and how all we really wanted at that point was just the, the transparency. What are the drop rates of this thing? And it's like, okay, well, here we go. Like it's a good step forward and we'll see where it goes from here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we can take care of our own business without having to get other people involved. But we'll yes. see. That's the goal. Step in the right direction. And just implement it faster. Also, don't yeah. forget, parents out there, that you can set limits on how much money your child spends on your console. It's a very important thing that there, you do. The, the parental controls on all three of the consoles are very in-depth now. Better now than at any time in history. And take advantage of them all. There are lots of great tutorials online to show you how to use all of those parental controls. And a lot of times your Wi-Fi provider also has parental controls. So if you want to lock down your Wi-Fi in your children's access to specific websites, um, a lot of providers on ISPs give really extensive parental controls for that as well. Mm -hmm. um, all right. On to yeah. the next story. <sighs> it's a doozy. This is a step in the wrong direction. I the story know. makes me so angry and sad. I know. Simon, you want to read this or you want me to read this okay. one? Uh, I can read the novel. Just let me move my microphone a little bit so I can read it better. <laughs> okay. Um, this is sort of a weird... Is this like the headline? Because this is a quote. Yeah, so the, the headline is a quote. If you want to just go to the, the sub-headline there and start there, you can. Cool. Uh, Ooblitz Dev addresses epic exclusivity harassment. This is by Emma Kent from Eurogamer. After a weekend of backlash to its timed exclusivity deal with Epic, the two-person studio behind Ooblets has publicly addressed the harassment it received in an official statement. While Glumberland acknowledged that some of the backlash was prompted by misunderstanding the, the tone of the original blog post, the studio also highlighted problems with toxicity within game communities and reaffirmed its decision to partner with Epic. Be advised, the Glumberland statement contains examples of graphic language sent by the developers. Oh no, if you... Don't like graphic language. I don't know why you're listening to this podcast. It's true. But that's just um, the quote that was in the story. Yeah, that's just in the story. <laughs> Written by Ben Wasser, also known as Perp Lamps. I think that's how you say it. <laughs> the, uh, the statement explains the severity of the backlash was partly caused by a sudden change in audience, which was unused to the team's communication style. Quote, for the past three years, I've been interacting with an audience that has always been understanding, friendly, and appreciative of our very open and transparent style, Wasser wrote. That's why we were totally unprepared for the attention we got from the broader gaming slash internet community, which was fueled by a deep misunderstanding of the tongue-in-cheek tone as condescending and patronizing. 
That being said, Wasser accepts he somewhat misjudged the situation, explaining he, quote, naively thought what we were saying might get them to see the whole EGS uh, Epic Game Studio debate as lightheartedly as we did. Quote by, uh, or continuing quote, by engaging directly with that crowd, I mistakenly thought I could have some impact on their opinions and emotions and diffuse the situation with some lighthearted criticism of the main things that drove them to attack people. You can see how well that went. It was a stupid miscalculation on my part. In the immediate aftermath of the original post, Wasser replied to several community questions over Discord, which he believed, quote, un unintentionally threw fuel on the fire when these messages were screenshotted. Wasser said this led to, quote, mischaracterizations of my messages taken out of context to insinuate I don't care about our patrons slash fans, along with a completely fabricated anti-Semitic message. Fantastic. Um, along with the fake messages, the Ublitz team was also sent, quote, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of messages on every conceivable platform, um, examples of which can be seen in the statement. These include a variety of racist and homophobic slurs, along with a variety of threats and messages about violence, rape, suicide, and self-harm. Another contributing factor, factor to the backlash, Wasser explained, is that many detractors seem to confuse Patreon with Kickstarter, quote, despite none of our Patreon tiers offering the game at all. <laughs> Amazing. This has previously been an issue with other Kickstarter-backed Epic exclusives, although Epic is now offering refunds for any future crowdfunded games that do go exclusive. Quote, whenever I've mentioned that we as random people happen to be making uh, a game, don't owe these other random people anything. They become absolutely enraged. Wasser explains. <laughs> Continuing, quote, we absolutely the, appreciate the support of fans and especially all our Patreon supporters who we've been in a communication with throughout all of this. We definitely owe them in relation to all that they've done for us and what we've promised them, and we really try hard to honor all of that. But one of the main reasons for the harassment, he wrote, is due to the problems with toxicity within game communities, and the studio stands behind its past statements. Quote, a game being available on one platform or the other, someone's tone, or them calling you entitled is not enough to justify harass a harassment campaign targeting two indie game developers, or anyone for that matter, he wrote. What, happens to us, what happened to us is the result of people forgetting their humanity for the sake of participating in video game drama. I recognize that none of this post equates to an apology in any way that a lot of the mob is trying to obtain, and that's by design. While some of what I've said was definitely bad for PR, I stand behind it. A portion of the gaming community is indeed horrendously toxic, entitled, immature, irrationally angry, and prone to joining hate mobs over any inconsequential issue they can cook up. That was proven again through this entire experience. It was never my intention to alienate or antagonize anyone in our community who does not fit that description, and I hope that you can see my tone uh, and pointed comments were not directed at you. Yesterday, Epic issued its own statement to condemn the, quote, disturbing trend of sending abuse to developers who accept an exclusivity deal for its store and call the, criti the critical discussion without harassment or the deliberate spread of false information. For its part, the Ublitz team and Epic has been supportive throughout the situation, or said Epic has been supportive throughout the situation and thanked the company for its help. Given that this is just the latest outrage in an increasingly toxic argument about Epic exclusivity deals, we'll no doubt see more harassment of developers as games sign up to the storefront. No matter your position on exclusivity deals or the manner in which a developer expresses their decision, sending violent threats is never acceptable. And in Our, this post, yeah. uh, there, he had shared screenshots of the exact threats that he... In, in, is it his wife that he works alongside? Yes. Uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, that they were receiving. And I mean, they're straight up horrific, just fucking terrible and, and awful. And we've met these people. <laughs> they're lovely, wonderful humans yes. that I've met on, on more than one occasion. And they're making this beautiful little game and putting so much of their life and their blood, sweat and tears into it. And of course they want to get paid. They've been working their asses off for multiple years. And if you're faced with the prospect of who knows if people will like it and will get paid or, hey, this store is gu guaranteeing us that we're going to get paid for our time, why on earth are you going after them for, for getting paid for their work? I just, these are people who aren't rational. They're not thinking clearly or they just... I mean, there, as we know, on the internet, there are literally threads and forums of people who just find anyone to get mad at for any reason. This isn't about Ubus joining the Epic Game Store. This is just about a group of people who want to be angry and mad and just take out their frustrations on life. It's the eye of Sauron. It's and the it eye of Sauron. It has it been has fixated been upon them. 
Because if you look at that, like you said, Andrea, you know, you you put your blood, sweat, and tears into a game, and then someone comes along and is like, we can guarantee your security and just like go make the best game you possibly can. Who in their right mind would say, I cannot do that? Why? I mean, Especially like, because it's timed. It's not like even yeah. forever exclusive. It's timed and exclusive. So, yeah, if you are like, oh, man, I really don't feel like downloading this other storefront. Yeah. You don't have so, to. You just got to wait. It kind of comes down to, you know, you if you're someone who's critical of the Epic Game Store and you voice your constructive criticisms in a fair way, you're please go on ahead. You're allowed to do that. But this is not that. This is something completely different. This is a whole nother monster. And I think it just speaks to the culture and video games that we have. I mean, we've been seeing this since the dawn of video game online comments. What I don't even know. But, you know, like whenever you, you could put a comment in there, I hope you die. Like, I hope you get cancer. I, I hope you get raped. Like, these are comments that we're used to seeing. And it's almost normalized this culture within our industry. And I, I would say it has. And it's when you see it, affecting people like this who literally like they've done nothing wrong and i've heard people say well they promised their game would be on steam but even if that's the case there's like take your money and go elsewhere like that is not warrant none of this nothing could possibly warrant these kind of threats these people are receiving it's not okay to do this and i would hope that the people listening to our show know that but it's just if you know someone who participates in this kind of activity on their downtime maybe like talk to them about it if you can it's just sickening. It makes me so sad and mad and angry and all of those things. Yeah. It's just, it is an unfortunate reality of the current internet culture, especially with gaming, because as I believe like one of his quotes up here uh, was talking about entitlement. And I think that's definitely a large part of it. Video games are so readily available. They haven't really, um, gone up in price much over the past whatever fucking decade like so people are used to expecting a certain thing and when they don't get it it is like a toddler tantrum and it's interesting to see the way some people react so ublitz is doing the tough parent of like we're not apologizing and we're not like this is what it is we are the parent in the situation and like if you don't like it fine and then there are definitely other times when other companies have sort of given in to said tantrum. So I think like there, it's, and that's why the tantrums continue to be quite honest is because if it gets results, of course, yep. like what else are you going to do? You're going to say, this is the only way anyone will be able to hear me is if I am horribly, I'm just like the worst version of myself on the internet that gets a response. Me being polite doesn't necessarily get a response. Um, so I think in part it is due to conditioning, and that is also unfortunate. I was reading the post that was originally created as well, and I personally really appreciate the transparency and the tone and the personality of the post because I'm someone who doesn't really give a shit about the Epic Games or, or Steam. You know, I just kind of like my outsider perspective. I rarely sure. use both. Um, so I was reading through it. I'm like, oh, this is like, I appreciate the transparency because that's always been something with What's Good Games. And even before we were, I was on What's Good with Blonde Nerd is I want to be transparent with my audience. I don't want to have to like pretend to be all PR and PC speak because that's like not me and that's dumb. So I was reading. I was like, okay, so what in here could have, you know, besides just joining the Epic Game Store, like what is it in this post that could have set people off? And there were two paragraphs that I think really just, I don't want to say annoyed people because that's not the case. Is it, it just people are just being irrational. But the first part was when he talked about what this means for people who want to play this game on PC. And what he says is what it means for you. You'll have to install EGS Epic Game Store if you want to buy Ooblets on PC. I know that's asking a lot, but I believe in you and your ability to download a free thing and create a user account if you haven't already done so to play Fortnite, which I know you have. And then later on when he starts talking about entitlement, he said, it's also really disappointing to see folks threatening to pirate a game just because they can't get it on the game launcher they're used to. Feeling like you owed the product of other people's work on your terms or else you'll steal it is the epitome of that word entitlement that people use to discuss immature, toxic gamers. Amen. Like, yep, yes. I, like, couldn't have said it better. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that 100% sums it up. Like, if you think you're owed anything by any company, to be quite honest with you, you are incorrect. Um, companies don't owe you shit. Now, that doesn't mean they shouldn't try and get your business because obviously you are the one voting with your wallet and giving them dollars. But that that is the two, two things are not equal. <laughs> like, that does not mean 
that therefore you own any part of this company or you should be in charge of any of the decisions made in this company. No, they will decide and you decide as the consumer whether or not you pay for that thing. And that doesn't mean steal it because that's also against the laws of humanity, really. And so <laughs> oh, there's a child screaming. I don't know if you can hear that. For but... a second, I thought it was a cat and then I realized the door <laughs> shut. And then I was like, oh, no, why would I be able to hear the cats? Are they outside? So I'm glad it was nope. a child and not a cat. Just a child running around <laughs> outside. Don't worry about it. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, anyways, yes. Yeah, that. No, is, that, was, yeah. that was very well said. And I always am of the mindset that you're allowed to have your feelings and you get to own your own emotions. And you are absolutely allowed to be frustrated and angry that a game you thought was going to come to the platform of your choice, decided that it's not. You're allowed to be mad and be like, yeah, dang it, I really wanted to play that game on Steam yeah. and I'm mad That's about it, but you're not allowed to go harass somebody because you're mad. And I think that goes for life in general, not just video games. And I think that it's indicative of a, of, of a larger toxicity in online spaces with our culture at large right now is that people are mad. They're mad about life. Life is fucking hard for a lot of people right now for a variety of reasons that we're not going to go into here because it would take way too long to list them all. <laughs> and, yeah. and just because you're mad about life and you get to be mad, you get to have that emotion. It does not mean that you get to go hurt somebody, that you get to harass somebody or threaten somebody or really say nasty things to anybody. Like that's just not how you deal with anger. If Instead, you, what you should do if you're having any of those inclinations is go find a therapist and try and work that shit out and learn some different coping mechanisms to deal with your anger that don't involve lashing out at other people. Because I guarantee you that shit doesn't work in the real world. Like if you had a real or like a real office job and you're in there and you're mad one day and you fucking punch someone or you call them any of the things that are in this blog post. You will be fired. You will be out on your ass. Like maybe are... incarcerated. Who could say? Yeah. <laughs> Depending on what the what you did. Yeah. Like so it's this is not how a real way to deal with any of the feelings that you're having, which again, as Andrea said, you are completely entitled to your feelings. Uh, and no one is saying otherwise. But what we're saying is you need to learn how to channel it. You need to grow up a little bit. This is another yes. opportunity to remind you of takethis.org, a mental health awareness website that says it's okay to not be okay. And if your version of not okay is you're really, really angry, then there are professionals out there that can help you with that anger. And you should yeah. maybe research some professionals and go, maybe my anger is not healthy. Take this.org. Yes. All right, yeah. Brittany, do we want to move on? Yeah. Do you, want, do you want to take the next one? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I need like I need a, a palate cleanser. How about um, we, oh, how about okay. this? How about we can skip this story and come back to it because a lot of people okay. have written in about it, um, and we can go to a nice palate cleanse of Pokemon. Would you like this one? Yeah. Oh, uh, but you want to take your, this this palate cleanser was made for you. This is perfect. Okay, I'm gonna talk about some Pokemon Sword and Shield shit. So today uh, Nintendo released their Galar region region update where they dropped some new info. And so I picked and choose some paragraphs from GameSpot. Just covered the, the meaty, lovely, dense chunks of information. <laughs> you like that? All right. So one of the big features that Pokemon Sun and Moon for 3DS introduced to the series was the Alolan Forms regional exclusive variants of some older Pokemon that boasted different appearance and typing. The upcoming Sword and Shield for Nintendo Switch will have their own regional variants as well. And we got to look at a handful of them in the game's latest trailer. <laughs> so first up is the Galarian Weezing. <laughs> which could, I needed this. Thank you, Simon. First is the Galarian Weezing, which could very well be this generation's equivalent of the wonderful Alolan Executor. I Galarian that guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Galarian Weezing has smokestacks atop its two heads that resemble long top hats, while the smog around its mouth looks like facial hair. You can see the dashy Pokemon for yourself below. It looks like a bong. It looks like a bong. It's a bong. <laughs> Hold on. I need to open this image. Now listen. It's coughing is one of the Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my god! It's so tongue in cheek. I fucking love it. So now, like, coughing has coughing I mean, is one of my most favorite Pokemon of all time. He's just so derpy and cute. I love him. Are you excited to get a stuffed version of this bomb? Oh my god! Yes. <laughs> I hope they make it. 
I, I don't smoke. I don't, but I would. No, I don't either. I, to me, they look like nuclear stacks. No, what or, I'm saying. But, uh, well, no, what I was going to say is that they, if someone out there makes a Galarian wheezing bong, I will buy it. And I will display it proudly in my office because that shit's fucking awesome. <laughs> no, it totally looks like a bong, but he's super cute. And I see what they're going for. But like, I guarantee there was some definite, definite intention in there because coughing, wheezing, it's like a po- poison type Pokemon. Of course, Isn't it's a the Pokemon bong. company's uh, North Did American. Did you say the Pokemon? Did you call it Pokemon? No, the Pokemon company's. I, the Pokemon are you company's- sure? I feel like you said Pokemon, which is I'm the best. I'm going to rewind that. Pokemon. I'm pretty sure she said- uh, it no, like the Pokemon. Pokemon- I think what I did is I uh, I strung the words together a little bit too closely. The Pokemon companies, um, I thought their North American headquarters were in Washington, like the state of they Washington. They are, yeah. It should be Redmond, I think. Yeah. Uh, Washington was like one of the first states to legalize marijuana. Is this a coincidence? Probably oh. not. I don't know. This is totally intentional, and I love every second of it. Okay, All right, next continue. we got... The Galarian Zigzagoon and Galarian Linoon. Unlike standard Zigzagoon and Linoon. I just love reading. I wasn't going to leave this detail in there, but I just love seeing your... I just love seeing your faces, like, glaze over. Okay, these forms have black <laughs> You know and white I love fur. Pokemon. What are you talking yeah, about? No, I'm more like Andrea. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay, you're right. You're a, poke- you're a Pokemon OG. So unlike standard Zigzagoon and Linon, Linon, these forms have black and white fur rather than brown, giving them a distinctly punk aesthetic. Ooh, Zigzagoon like. looks like a skunk. Intriguingly, Galarian Linon is capable of evolving into an entirely new Pokemon named Obstagoon, a.k.a. Uh, Gene Ob- Simmons. <laughs> it's just so Gene dumb. Simmons. No, no, he looks like Gene Simmons from Kiss. Wait, I mean, what? Obst- okay, O B S T A. Copy googling Obstagoon. <laughs> Obstagoon. O B S T A G O O N. By the yeah. way. Yeah. No, he looks like a big old. He looks no, like no, a honey, no. he looks like Honey Badger. No, no, no. He looks like Gene Simmons. Hold and on, there's, I have to switch to like, my network. He's Gene oh. Simmons meets Honey Badger. Google, Google Obstagoon Gene Simmons, and then the first Google image. Oh my gosh, he definitely looks like Gene Simmons. Is Obstagoon photoshopped Holy into a Kiss concert? Holy crap! Okay, so for people who oh are my listening, God, yes. Obstagoon <laughs> kind of looks like a like an actual Wolverine, not like the X Men character, but like if you knew what a, a real Wolverine looked like. Um, he's a Wolverine or a Badger, like yeah, that kind so like, of thing. So like, uh, like dark gray, white, and like lighter gray, like kind of stripes on the side. Um, he's got the the dark gray over his eyes, much like Gene Simmons does his kiss makeup, and then his tongue is out. This long, pink tongue just hanging out of his mouth. Looks so good. I'm very excited about this. Yeah, he's gonna be in my party. Ob- I'm gonna yeah. catch me one of him. But also, like, where does that name come from? Because don't most of the Pokemon names have, like, a, some kind of derivative of what they are? I don't know, Andrea. Anymore. I don't know. I can't what, keep like, track. What is there's like, known? There's, like, 800,000 yeah, of them. Okay. So, um, what is Linoon? Is that the... I don't he know. He looks like the weird little... Like a weird oh. Dog. Oh, yeah. The no, lower he's, version of he's him. He's another little, like, rodent Pokemon. I can't keep track of... We need a fucking exterminator up in this bitch. All right. And so then after that, beyond that, the latest trailer revealed an entirely new Gen 8. This one's really cute. I think you both will like it. Pokemon named More Peko, which appears to be this generation's adorable electric rodent Pokemon. Interestingly, oh, it's the one. More, Pe- More Peko is able to change between full belly and hangry modes. Wait, the what? Latter of w- yes, me? the latter of He's which me. turns into a dark type and gives it a more menacing appearance. <laughs> I'm so excited that I have a Pokemon that means is me. Oh my yeah, god! Did you see the Did you see the the difference, Timer, between the coloring on them? The the more Where Peko. So like on more the left, he, he does look strikingly. Oh, yes. Does look strikingly like uh, got the same cheeks, the cheek circles as Pikachu. Uh, the ears are shorter and a little bit more round, and he's yellow down the middle. If you guys haven't seen more Peko yet. And on the on his right half, he's got like a light brown. On his left half, he's got like a dark gray, but he's yellow all down the middle. But it does look like a could be like a, a cousin of Pikachu. But that's his like happy form. Apparently, his hangry form. He gets like dark purple and gray, and he's got the angry eyes, and he's got the upside down mouth. It's he's amazing, so and I can't wait to make him hangry because, like, <laughs> holy shit, that's so much better than the pocket one. So, yeah, more Peko people were, like, doing on Twitter today. They're like, do you like my new Pokemon? Thanks. It has pockets. Like, 
Because he looks like he's like oh, got little, it that's does. Because right, he looks neck. like he's putting his hand in his pocket. Yeah. yeah. Oh that's yeah. Where, I that's see why it. he's full belly mode. It's because he's eating from his yeah. pocket snacks. But then he, if he doesn't, and then his other one, his arms are up his, and out of the pockets because he doesn't have any food and he's mad. He's Very like a, he's getting tater tots out of his pocket like Napoleon Dynamite. Oh my <laughs> yes, God. exactly. I just start storing tater tots in my pocket. Uh, the trailer <laughs> also introduced two new rival characters named Bede and Marnie, as well as this generation's villainous team, Team Yell, who, uh, yes. appear, to be, who appear to be more like hooligans than an actual cr- criminal organization. So Bede or Betty or Bede or whatever you want to say, he looks, like a, he looks like a little punk. Like I'm not into him. He has like this weird hair. He can go away. But Marnie is this interesting, like goth looking girl. And I think her whole shtick is that team yell is the group that follows her. They're like her groupies or her fans. And so they follow her everywhere they go. you go. And they try to, they try to make it so you cannot become the Pokemon master. You are meant to be team yell very original very nintendo very pokemon and then the other thing we got from the trailer was that there's a new mechanic in the uptidy upcoming title called pokejubs so of course we have the gigantamaxine and we have the new raid battles but we have a new thing coming so each pokemon center in the galar region features a new type of pc called a rotomi in addition to being able to store your extra pokemon here the rotomi appears to serve a similar purpose as job boards and other rpgs letting you browse through a list of available poke jobs once you accept one you can then send your pokemon from your box out to complete the task and they'll return after a certain amount of time with rewards pokemon you send off on jobs will earn experience points and may even net you some rare items certain types of pokemon will be more suited to specific jobs and the amount of rewards you receive will depend on how long the pokemon works and how suited they were for the test Reminds me of a Viva Pinata when you would ship your pinatas off to spe- specific parties yeah. and then they would come back once they were done with the party. Yeah, I mean, it's a mechanic Hilarious. we've seen in games for a while, right? Yeah, and absolutely. What I love about it is like, yeah, I, I don't want to have to grind all my Pokemon. I'm just going to send them off on jobs. Yeah, like, this is, go get this a is, job, yeah, Pokemon. You're, you're 16 now. Go fucking work, you stupid bong wheezing. <laughs> Whatever you are. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Oh. And then we're going to send Obstagoon off to many concerts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Go my sing. God. Listen, like, I have never waned in my, like, confusion about the randomness of Pokemon. But I kind of love that it's gotten so absurd that it's just, like, you can't help but be like, okay, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm here for the hangry Pokemon. <laughs> And the Gigantamaxing and the bong wheezing. Wait, no, there's so Gigantamaxing bad. and Dynamaxing. Oh, yeah, that's right. Dynamax and then you Gigantamax. That's when you yeah. get really turned on. You Gigantamax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, good. That's a good story. We need more stories like this. Yes. Yes. More anyway, Pokemon, please. November 15th. I'm very excited. Bring me my Pokemon. I got all my pre-orders ready. I got my midnight launch all set. I'm ready. Let's do this. Let's go. Woo. <laughs> all right. Now we have to take a downward turn, which is sad. Is this the last story? Um, well, there's a bunch of other stories that I don't know if we're going to want to spend time on, um, but we can, if there's any of those that are, um, we need like a happy thing to end on. I'll try to find something. Maybe silly. this one. Like we can end on that one and I can start reading the other one now. Sure. Um, so do you want me to read this one, Steimer, since you were the more... other long one? Sure. If you would like to go for it. All right. Yeah. Here this we is go. like a novel. So. Oh yeah. And just, so this story is about, um, a Borderlands three and two K. So as uh, your friendly reminder, disclaimer, I worked at the Borderlands three reveal event, um, Borderlands three take two addresses investigation into streamer leaks. This is written up by Matt Kim, who is a fantastic gentleman over at IGN. And, um, I really appreciate the diligence Matt did with this story, which is why, Uh, We weren't actually going to put this in the rundown by we. I mean, I wasn't going to put this in the rundown because most of what I'd seen about this story was just a bunch of uh, inflammatory posts, a bunch of YouTubers reacting and not really actually going and doing the due diligence of doing the research. But Matt did it and he's great. So (laughs) big ups to Matt Kim. Give them the click over at IGN.com. Here we go. Wednesday morning, the hashtag boycott Borderlands 3 began trending on Twitter. The hashtag was created in response to a video published by Borderlands YouTuber Supmato, who claimed he was the target of an investigation by Take-Two Interactive and Borderlands 3 leaks. IGN has learned that the 2K Games and Take-Two, the parent company of 2K, as well as Rockstar and Private Division, have indeed been investigating Supmato's Borderlands 3 videos as part of a wider investigation into an on, excuse me, ongoing Borderlands 3 leak. Just as a reminder... 
Rockstar Games, Private Division, and 2K are all underneath Take-Two Interactive, in case you were wondering, why are those people interested? 2K serves as the publisher on Borderlands 3, which is being developed by Texas-based video game studio Gearbox Software. Earlier this week, YouTuber Supmato published a video that claimed that two private investigators showed up at his residence to inquire about his Borderlands YouTube account. Quote, I don't feel like I have anything to hide. They questioned me about various things relating to my channel, the live stream that was discussed on my channel, and they told me they were from Take-Two Interactive, end quote. However, our investigation, meaning IGN's, revealed a complicated 10-month investigation initiated by 2K and Take-Two into prominent Borderlands 3 leaks. In a statement to IGN, 2K confirmed the investigation into Submato. Quote, Take-Two and 2K take the security and confidentiality of trade secrets very seriously. The action we've taken is the result of a 10-month investigation and a history of this creator profiting from breaking our policies, leaking confidential information about our product, and infringing our copyright, a 2K Games representative said. Submato's video focused on an incident related to the official Borderlands 3 Twitch extension, which Submato reported based on a Twitch exploit. Quote, it's not some crafty workaround, Supmato claims in his video. On April 29th, the official Borderlands YouTube channel posted the reveal of the Twitch extension leading into the gameplay reveal. I can confirm that I was there. And the name of the testing accounts were exposed in that video. This wasn't found by me. However, 2K alleged that Submato's leaks into Borderlands 3 goes far beyond just the Twitch extension. Submato's YouTube channel has published videos dating back to 2018 with information on Borderlands 3, including accurate details on characters and mechanics months ahead of Borderlands 3 official reveal. In our discussions with 2K, we've learned that the Twitch streams Submato used as sources were set to private, not public, as Submato claims. We were told that it was an exploit in Twitch's security that allowed Submato's community to data mine their way into getting access to the thumbnail previews on what were private test streams. This puts Supmato's claims in his Borderlands 3 videos into question. So I'm going to pause there for a second to just do a quick explanation as to what's happening here. Supmato was a YouTuber. He watched the Borderlands 3 reveal, much like millions of people did around the world. And he, like a couple of other people, noticed some quick screenshots of some stuff that was happening in the Twitch EchoCast Chrome, or excuse me, EchoCast Twitch extension trailer, meaning that 2K Games had a private Twitch channel set up with um, offline accounts so that they could test their streaming functionality and not actually go live on a channel that alerted people. However, they left a freeze frame of one of these shots that had the usernames of the channels in some, you know, enterprising young individual on the internet's like, hey, we should follow those like random channel names and see if they ever go live again and see if we can get some sneak peeks. Because I think what 2K was intending to do was to make dummy accounts on Twitch and then practice this with the extension and see if it worked. Um, if you want to really want to dig into the story, there's a whole other sidebar about like how Borderlands API works and how they created the Twitch channels and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go over that here. If you really want to dig in and you want to learn about it, you can go do that on your own time. But essentially, I guess the only part that is confusing to me is like, to our knowledge, because we would use it if it was real, Twitch didn't have private streams. Like you are streaming live or you may be on an account no one fucking knows, mm -hmm. but like it's still public. Well, they don't have private streams available to for the, us for the, for normies, right? Even for their yeah. partners. They may have a private stream functionality for a giant partner like Take Two Interactive, right? We don't know. I, I haven't reached out to Twitch to ask them if they provide private streaming API services, if somebody's developing an extension for their platform. I do know from working with 2K at the Borderlands event, they did do extensive work with Twitch specifically for this extension. And that's why they were promoting Twitch so heavily during the stream and why you could only watch it really on, on Twitch, though you could watch it on YouTube afterwards, was because they worked very closely with Twitch on it. So yeah, of course. that being said, I would hypothesize that perhaps they did have access to private channels that Twitch does not make available to the general public. But back to the story. According to sources, um, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. That's where I was. Um, in our discussion, blah, 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 blah. Okay, here we go. 
Quote, the information he's sharing about the situation is incomplete and in some cases untrue, a 2K representative said in a statement to IGN. Not only were many of his actions illegal, but they were negatively impacting the experience of other content creators and our fans in anticipation of the game, end quote. So he was essentially showing these like these thumbnails that had details about late game stuff so you could see information that they didn't actually want to show. So basically he was like, hey, look at this cool like stuff about Borderlands 3 that we're not supposed to see. Since the battle's encounter with 2K's private investigators, we've learned that he has deleted several, not all, of the Borderlands 3 videos that contained leaked information from his YouTube channel, seemingly without rhyme or reason. These include several leaked reports published months before the Borderlands 3 PAX East reveal. According to sources familiar with the matter, previously listed perks on Sup Maddle's YouTube channel allegedly offered access to a private Discord channel that included further Borderlands 3 leaked information in exchange for a $5 membership to his YouTube channel. In Sup Maddo's video, he revealed that his Discord channel was shut down and received the following notice from Discord about his account involved in selling, promoting, and distributing cheats, hacks, or cracked accounts. IGN has learned that both Twitch and Discord were investigating Sup Maddo's Twitch channel and Discord server, respectively, and they've reached out to both Twitch and Discord for confirmation. As IGN understands it, at this time, take two and take Take Two and 2K are not pursuing legal action against Submato, but the incident is part of a larger and ongoing investigation by 2K and Take Two over Borderlands 3 trade secrets. Quote, we will take the necessary actions to defend against leaks and infringement of our intellectual property that not only potentially impact our business and partners, but more importantly, may negatively impact the experiences of our fans and customers, 2K said in a statement. We have attempted to reach out to Submato for this story, but we're unable to find contact methods on his YouTube channel or his Twitter and Discord servers, which were down at the time. Ha. Huh. Well, maybe don't go data mining and trying to sell, basically sell leaked information yeah. <laughs> on the internet. It's not a, a great idea. Like, there's data mining is not a thing that's uncommon, but usually you don't paywall it. <laughs> Um, I don't know. It's sort of weird. Like it's, this is just a strange, it's a strange world we live in. I don't know. The reason I brought this story up, because normally we wouldn't necessarily talk about the individual legal happenings of a single YouTuber, but I brought it up because a lot of people had, had kind of like added me on Twitter about this saying like, how do you feel about this? As someone who's excited for Borderlands, you're going to boycott Borderlands for this. And I was like, wait, so I had to do some digging into what was going on with this story because the first video I watched seemed pretty egregious against the part of 2K and Take Two. It seemed that he was claiming that these private investigators showed up at his house. They questioned him, which for the record, if it's not a law enforcement officer, you do not have to talk to anybody that shows up at your front door. You tell them to GTFO. Even if it is a you law enforcement them. officer, they need a warrant. They need a warrant. Yes, they need they need due cause. <laughs> they need a warrant. You say, I'm calling my lawyer. Um, you don't have to talk to anybody about anything. Um, so first and foremost, just so you guys remember that, that's true. And so I was watching this video uh, from a different YouTuber explaining the situation about how he found this information that was publicly available. Um, but now we're seeing that the claim is that it wasn't publicly available. I do know that that video that went live to everybody did have the screenshot of the, of the names of the Twitch channels. And so if you did want to data mine, you would have the information and 2K just put that out there. So I think it's a little in the weeds to talk about what's public and what's not. Um, I think if a company like Take Two comes to you and says, hey, like the stuff that you are going after in this information is, is you know, not available for public consumption. It's private data. If anybody came to you and made a request, you know, I hope you would put it under thoughtful consideration of what is the outcome of me putting this information out there? Am I preventing somebody from getting harmed? Am I doing, you know, like a public service by, you know, whistleblowing something? You have to really think about what you're doing with this data and how you're going to handle it. It seems to me that part of the story is missing, both from 2K and Take Two's side and also from Sup Matto's side. It certainly seems gross that he was charging money for people to get access to a private Discord server so that he could show them the leaks. That's just I, bad form, yeah. dude. 
I think people just forget that and this this might sound weird, but work with me here that video game video games and developers and publishers, they are legal companies. They are a business. They make money. You can't exploit any way, shape or form of that in any way, shape or form you want to and expect to. Oh, my goodness. Woe is me when you get in trouble for it. Like, that's just the reality of it. And this is like really shady shit. If, you know, this five dollar membership and to get further Borderlands three leaked information like I mean, I, I I feel like you don't have to be like the sharpest pencil or sharpest crayon, brightest crayon in the box, whatever, mm-hmm. to to know that like that's just, you know what I mean. But also I the, just... the idea that there's a hashtag boycott Borderlands three simply because they sent investigators to his house to question him, but have said to IGN or at least as they understand it, are not pursuing legal action. They've just done DMCA takedowns of his videos. Yeah. I just, I again, uh, it, it, this is, yeah. The yeah. internet likes to get its panties in a twist over anything they deem an injustice to themselves. Like yeah. it's not even like an injustice to the world over like anybody. Like they're not normal injustices. Like this is a kind of a whatever story to me. So, like yeah. yeah, you were a content creator, and I think if this information was even. Even if he was like, uh, there's just like so many different like little ways around this where it would have been technically like okay by me. Like, yeah, it's not great. You shouldn't probably do it, but like, it's if legal they're allowed, if, if, and, like it's it's fine. legal it's and whatever, use, and like whatever. okay, sure, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it kind of yeah, it seems like both parties kind of fucked up. Like, 2K fucked up on the end of not making sure that their shit was secured. Yeah. Um, or that it was on a platform that was secured. If they knew Twitch had issues, like, why would you be putting that type of content on there? Why wouldn't you just be, if you were streaming anything, stream shit you know you've already shown, um, and just test those parts, like, over and over again? Just stream the trailer back to back all day long. Exactly. Right? Like do something, do something that you, well, I mean, I don't know what, what they may have been trying to test functionality with the actual gameplay of the extension, which fine, but like, keep it be like, you can only do this for the first 20 minutes of the game. And then you're quitting and you're starting over. And right, like, that's the how part you, that we streamed you, at the reveal event. Right. Exactly. You can mitigate risk like that. Um, and then somebody like Samato can't do what he did where he's just, basically scraping information off of this website and selling it. And the selling part is really where you get fucked. Right. It's like they could pursue legal action because especially because he sold it. I think it would be not harder, but they would be less like even less inclined. They probably are still less inclined. Cause like, it's not a great look to sue somebody over it. Um, especially when it's like a dude, <laughs> but um, they, they could because of the fact that he's selling information basically. Or appears to be selling information. Whereas if it's like, I am just sort of publicly putting it out there, that is more of like a, a DMCA, like, shut the fuck up sort of a situation. Yeah. Uh, and it's a lot easier to handle that way. This one's going to be hard, again, because money was involved. And, like, who knows how many people joined that and wanted to get, quote, unquote, secret information about the game because they're excited for it. and. <sighs> Yeah, it's uh, this is what <laughs> you it's doing, like all a uh, big old clusterfuck. I just, I, you know, you, you ladies know me and listeners know me. I'm a very bubbly, optimistic, glasses always half full, like, I believe, but whatever, whatever. But man, this week has just been a fucking doozy. Just the stuff I'm seeing and the stuff I'm reading. And why would you boycott Borderlands 3 over this when this like, dude there are is literally other reasons to boycott selling... Borderlands 3? This, yeah, is, this, this to is me, not, this is not one of them. Yeah. This ain't it. If you, there's a lot of other reasons you could do that, but like this right here, ain't it right? And it's, it, this dude is selling information that belongs to a company and he has no possession over that information, has no right to be selling it. He got busted. Why boycott Borderlands three? Cause they're trying to protect their property. I just, uh, I do cheers. not know. Cheers. I have some resident evil news. If we want to like change topics. Uh, yeah, so we're going to let Brittany end on her Resident Evil news, but I just want to quickly rapid fire a couple of other headlines that we don't have time to get to because this news segment has always has already gone incredibly long. But GTA Online is back and bigger than ever. 
they have officially made the most revenue from Grand Theft Auto 5 with microtransactions in GTA Online because their new casino expansion is apparently super popular. Shocker. Hey. Who doesn't want to go to Vegas in a virtual world? I do. Let's go. Um, Google Stadia has announced that there will be having a press conference at Gamescom. What will they say? Let's not speculate. It's happening next week. Uh, Evo happened. Hooray! Esports for the FGC. A lot of crazy shit went down. Some of it was cool. Some of it was bad. But most of it was exciting and good for video games. I feel like there's always some like negative thing that happens at evo because there's always one ass hat in the fgc that ruins it for the rest of the good people out there and we're not going to take the time to talk about that ass hat because he doesn't deserve it um <sighs> but we also have a story about anthem's cataclysm update is finally here omg it just was delayed a couple of months but maybe yeah i was like wasn't that supposed to happen in may it was but maybe it's a good thing because maybe it's where it's supposed to be i haven't played it yet i'm gonna download it i'm gonna try it we'll talk about it on the show next week and then lastly, uh, the president of the United States made a statement after the two horrific mass shootings that happened here in the United States last weekend about video game violence and its contribution. I think we can all give a big fuck you to that statement because video Correct. games are a great unifying force and do a lot of wonderful things. What they don't do is cause people to go out and murder other human beings. Those were clearly <sighs> sick individuals. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Brittany. Resident Evil. Take it home with yes, Resident Evil yes, 2. Okay, let's end this thing on a good note. Okay. So recently, I think this just was this week or, yeah, let me, August 1st. Okay, so late last week, Capcom's Division 1, who does Resident Evil and Devil May Cry, sent out an email to their Capcom or Resident Evil ambassadors. And this is what the email said. To all Resident Evil ambassadors, thank you for your patronage regarding the Resident Evil series. Today, we are letting you know that we are recruiting testers for a game that's in development. We are oh. interested in incorporating the feedback of all ambassadors into our development, so please read the details below. And if you are interested in participating, click the entry button. And then in late June, Capcom had a Resident Evil ambassador meeting in Tokyo. Now, this, this is not news. I mean, it's news in the sense that I'm all excited. My panties are in a nice, pleasurable, twisted bundle over it. But it's just the fact that... What are the details? But they, they didn't show the details because I'm sure it's under a strict NDA. So all they shared was, like, the screen capped version of the email. <sighs> Wait, so they were actually good? And, like... Only think, partially leaked information? <laughs> I, if that's what it, yeah, like that's literally what it looks like. So that's funny. They were like, you know what? We're gonna leak this, but we're not gonna we're not gonna be total asshats. We're gonna be partial asshats. Partial and just asshats. tell people that this exists, but not actually spoil the fun. I know. So uh, so I appreciate partial ass hattery. So <laughs> So what do you think this is, Brett? Okay, so this could either be Resident Evil Eight or Resident Evil 3 Nemesis Remake. Now, there's a rumor going around that Resident Evil 3 Remake is going to be at Jeff Keighley's press conference for Gamescom in Cologne. I don't think that's going to happen. Gamescom, but if I... uh, what, what was the official name? I, Jeff sent me like five press releases for that. Hold on. Let me yeah, see. it has a, let's see, um, a thing. Let's see. The thing is called... Gamescom. Oh, I don't know. All oh, I know is like Gamescom opening night live. More than 15 publishers set to debut world premiere content and make announcements during Gamescom opening night live on August 19th at 8 p.m. CST or 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Or for us here on the West Coast, it's a pleasurable 11 a.m. Pacific. Oh, yay. That's great. So yeah, the rumor is that Resident Evil 3 remake. I don't know. Seems a little soon. Granted, I would I would take it. I would take it willingly. And I yes, um, that's what she said. The other, that is what she said. <laughs> the other Resident Evil news is that back when I was actually at your house, Andrea, and it was Steimer, um, Alana, and I, we did the show from your place when you were in Australia. You were somewhere. That it was in right. late January. Yeah. Um. We talked about Resident Evil coming to Netflix and how there's a story that broke that there's a series that they're, they're, they're trying to figure out who's going to be part of it and all that. But it's going to delve into the Resident Evil lore and whatnot. Well, yesterday or the day before, it made a huge reappearance on social media. I lost my shit because I thought it actually had happened. Turns out there's no official confirmation. And the viral image that was being shared across of the supposed Resident Evil Netflix series was actually an altered one of the Haunted Mansion. Oh, 
so. Oh no. That Dupe. goes to show you what I know. That said, that said, though, a few outlets are reporting it as being confirmed. I don't know if that's for clickbait. I don't know where these sources are coming from, but I like to say where there's smoke, there's fire, and this is absolutely 100% happening. That well, I hope for your sake it is. I think Thanks. Resident Evil would make a great Netflix series. Um, I, mean, I will never watch it. I'll watch <laughs> it with you, Brittany. Thanks. I like watching no, scary good. shit. I just don't like. I know. That's why I stuff. always go to bed. <laughs> you guys are like, we're watching thing. I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> yeah, but last what? night we were all together. We, we just stopped. <laughs> we just, we paid for it and then we never watched it. I know. Yeah. We cooked a whole bit. Oh, what'd you say, Andrew? You're like, let me know if I'm crossing the line, but I want to bake a bunch of cookies. I was like, fuck, <laughs> I should bake the cookies. And then I like, I walked out because I'd had a bath. And then Andrew was like, we're baking cookies. And I was like, cool, I'm going to bed. Good night. <laughs> Just turn happened? around and walk straight to sleep. <laughs> yeah, it was a good night. Yeah, we ate the cookies and we were just up chatting. I don't remember what we were talking about, but we started. The problem was I started the movie, so we were going to watch Us. Because yeah. I haven't seen it yet, and I've heard nothing but good things about it. And I was like, who's the perfect person to watch this with? Brittany. And so I bought it um, on, like, my on-demand cable system. And then we started it. And I was, then we just started chatting. And I paused. And I was like, this seems like the movie that we should probably be listening to. Uh, and then we never finished it. And instead, yeah. the next night, we watched Detective Pikachu. And it was amazing. Yeah. So good. Good time. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us for the first segment. Can you believe it, ladies and gentlemen? Over an hour in. And we have more What's Good Games to come. Stick with us. We're going to take a brief break. When we come back, we're going to talk about what we've been playing. Plus, we've got those mythic patron shout outs. We'll be right back. everybody and welcome back to the what's good games podcast it's segment two and this is where we talk about what we've been playing and this week we're holding stuffed animals at youtube.com slash what's good games i've got I don't have one here. henry the seal bando I, I i just this just happened like i just got inspired sorry steimer next time i'll, I'll let you be prepared Ste yeah. uh, Brittany, who do you who do you have there i have a nug from dragon age oh Yay. it's very cute so cute. It looks like a little Done. pig. Hold it directly in front of a, a top of your microphone. Yeah, there we go. Let's get a nice shot. Yeah, and give me a little side shot. A little side shot. Okay. So my question about this nug is that it looks like a little piggy, but it doesn't have a curly tail, but it has whiskers. Yeah. Do pigs have whiskers? You, you, didn't, you don't remember the nugs? No. The Nugs are a rodent in Dragon Age, in, in the Dragon Age lore, and they're also, they're used in like, uh, in, in, oh, was I, sorry, what am I trying to say, Simer? Like, when someone's mad, they'll use a Nug's name in vain. It's oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> they do! No, they I do. know, I know, I just, it, that was a really funny sentence. <laughs> they'll use a Nug's, Before, they'll use a okay, Nug's name in vain. The Nug's are animals that populate the underground locations of Thetis. They are small, hairless, nearly blind creatures with pointed snouts for digging. Huh. Yes, that is that is a nug, and they are in Dragon Age. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The dwarves have really funny um, phrases about them, and that's all. Yep, uh, I, I have no stuffed animals, so oh, you're smart. Well, let me help you. I'll, I'll give you one. Then I have two two at my office at my, on my desk at work. I have Boomer from Far Cry, and I have Dog Meat from Fallout. Oh, oh you little puppo friends. That's yeah. nice. That's cute. Doggo friends are great. Um, before we get to what we've been playing, it's time for us to shout out our mythic patrons and above at patreon.com slash what's good games. Yes, this is where we have a nice moment to say thank you to those that support everything we do here. I know I've said this before and I'll say it again. We literally could not do What's Good Games without our Patreon supporters, the people that have been with us. A lot of you have been with us since day one, since we launched back in May of 2017. And your ongoing support is fantastic. And whether you've been a patron and you or you've, you know, dropped your pledge or came back or you're like, I'm going to come back later or maybe you're like hey i've never thought about pledging maybe this is your moment um but our mythic patrons and above are in our shout out tier and so we're going to 
read their names with as much care as we can. <laughs> <laughs> basically we're gonna fuck your name up so let us think basically so i'm gonna start Britt will pick it up and then we'll go to Steimer. and we're just gonna run down this list are you ready, ready. here we go yeah. let's start with david Icolushi. alex Rogopoulos. mohammed mohammed ferris ate matthew simpson joe kennison filet alajmi fala fala oh don't worry about that Did I say oh, okay. wrong? i'm sorry dude adam bankhurst Monsieur Vigilius. I fucked that up a little bit. I'm it's sorry. Okay, I for some reason. It's okay, You're going to meet him at PAX. It's going to be great. Actually, you met him. He's the one who brought his pie I feel like I've met him. Yeah, I know. I was like, I've met also, him. I just I'm his tipsy name. off of the whiskey that he brought us. So thank you, sir, <gasps> once again. Oh, I want some of that. I, he may have said he's bringing some to PAX, and I'm going to force him to let me drink it. Ah! And by force, right. I mean ask nicely. Andrew Susan. Justin Foshi. Sean I. Kia Bright. Alberta Vidala. Drew Quesada. Martha Emery. Seven Nitz. Def Wu. Reagan Inson. Bill Stilwell. Sarah Bruno. Zach Hershey. Yes. See, oh, fuck. Sean Stevenson. <laughs> there you go. Oh. He did it. Michael it. Shadholt. <laughs> Patrick Higgins. <laughs> Marco Ontiveros. RJ Bryan. Travel Sucking. Marcus Brown. Melanthius G. Owens. He saw the mach. Joe Schleif. Maxwell Kramer. El Moschel. Jared Howard. Tyler McCall. Kyle Peterson. Molly Bittner. Joselle Bassa. Damwi. Varun. Tracy Hunt. Jessica Bloom. Throw seven. Dylan Blank. Noel Navarez. Lucas Cheney. Lucas Cheney is what Brenda no, I... would say for this friend. Shit. Yep. Rob Leonard. <laughs> no, so here you go. <laughs> Mark Trestra. John Drake. That guy. He's great. He's going to help me build us a new studio. Jacob yeah. Safari. Adam Carniston. Emily Kent. Trent Pennington. Gabriel Andrea Renee. <laughs> Chris Wilson. <laughs> That's not your name, Gabriel. I'm sorry. Ariella Furman. Will Callum. Will Hernandez. Brian R. Johnson. Billy Shibbs. Stephanie Fitzwilliam. Sam. Marty McFly. That's not Pumped a real fad. <laughs> Ross Haney. Simon. Oh, God. Bergstead. <laughs> Justin Foss. <laughs> Nicole Humphrey. Brooke Larie. Asia Harris. Jake Sue. Jez Jasmine Lee. Carly Kidman. Elizabeth Brooke. Adrian Williams. Kyle Kaiser. Pure Blue Octopus. Blah, 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 blah. Andrew Cotton. Tony Shea. Ha, ha. Pete Shoemaker. Brian Harper. Joe Wilson. Sydney Carr. Gio Corsi. Roland Bala. Robert Adams. Paige Porter. The Coast Dog 420 Man. <laughs> Patrick Weller. <laughs> Matthew Godere. Michaela Sage. Ozzy Mirha. Christian Rodriguez. Patrick Dear Landry. E. Benjamin Shinnikus. Wait, how do you say that? Check it. Shinnikus. Shinnikus. I like Shinnikus. it. <laughs> Trent Berry. <laughs> Donato Sinichio the fan. Uh, Teresa Enert. I love you, Mom. Ivan Baharano. Thank you yeah. so much to all of our um, mythic patrons and above. We love you guys and thank you for supporting everything we do here at What's Good Games. And now let's talk about time to talk about what we've been playing. And before we get into a deep dive of Fire Emblem, because I know it's happening, oh my I want to so talk excited. about my time oh. shooting Nazis with one Christine Steimer. Yeah. So we ended up playing Wolfenstein Youngblood together. And I want to say thank you, Steimer, for sending me multiple text messages being like, are you ready to play? Hey, is tonight the <laughs> night? Hey, are we going to play together yet? Yo, yo, poke, poke. Um, when are we going to play this game together? And I finally um, got on board and, and got to play. I've admittedly been very busy with preparing for the move to Los Angeles and not been playing much of anything. I did have a, a one night of the Destiny Solstice event, which I may or may not talk about. Um, but... We got to play, and it was really fun. Yeah! It was fun with you, but, like, I don't know that I liked it. From the, um, so, that sounds weird. No, no, I, I understand <laughs> like, exactly what you mean. Continue. 
<laughs> yeah. So the first two portions, of, like two, I guess, major sections of the game, I played alone and you played alone. Um, so, sorry, did she join your game? Yes. Okay. So we made it to the catacombs. Once you're at the catacombs, the game kind of fundamentally changes. Yeah. Um, so the first few sections are a little bit more traditional. Wolfenstein, they're linear. You'll run through the thing. You'll know usually exactly where to go because there's really not that many other options and go through. You'll call a bunch of Nazis. It'll be great. You'll have a good time. Um, once you hit the catacombs, the game kind of morphs into an... Other people, I guess, that I've read about on the internet have likened it to, like, a Destiny. I don't know if that's the exact best example, but I understand... It's not. From a... from a, I sort of get where they were going with the comparison in the sense that you will be traveling back to sections of the same map um, that you were at before, and, like... You you can encounter random and quests like like the person on the radio will be like so there's a Nazi over there like you need to go kill him or like oh hey there's like go put a bug blow over here car. yeah blow, blow up. yeah do these random things on these they're honestly not to me that large like these quote unquote open world maps that are really small for like an open world sort of a thing um, and but the main problem that Andrea and I kept having where we were I, I honestly was wanted to be like fuck this game was the enemies respawn so fast they are just on your ass at all times oh. and so even when you clear out an area and we were playing on normal by the way uh i felt like you just couldn't have a lot of breathing room like the minute you cleared out a section and you like went a little bit far forward if you backtracked uh they were there again and you were like ah. cool Hey, I just killed Nazi you gets... like a couple minutes ago. What are you doing alive again? Yeah, so that part was really strange. And then I think, um, Andrea, you mentioned this when we were playing. You were like, Wolfenstein's never been tr very good at player direction and like, hey, level design indicating where you should be going. The the fact that they are trying to do sort of open world maps on these other sections is really like it exacerbates it so much. You just really tell the like direction for them is hard and it's difficult for you as the player to really know where you need to be going and how you can get there in the first place like you may need to go up you may need to go around and down and to the left and then through a courtyard and then down to the basement and then up again and like there's just so many weird ways of getting to where you need to go um i just found it like kind of an annoying experience which was weird because the preview event I was so happy with because it was those more traditional Wolfenstein levels that they showed us and not like the weird kind of open world part that you have to keep going back to. Yeah, it was mm. incredibly frustrating. So first off, um, thank you to Bethesda for sending us code so that Steimer and I could play together. Um, just so for disclosure purposes, they provided us with, with codes and we each got a code. So we could have hypothetically tested out the buddy system, but we didn't. And that's important to note because when I went into Steimer's game, I retained all of my individual progress and the things that I had unlocked for my character, even though technically the skin was a different, I was, um, I was Soph and you were Jess and in my playthrough, I picked Jess as well. Um, but, but then when I went back to my game, I retained all of the progress we had made together and you oh, only, good. and you only get that if each person in the game has purchased a copy. If you're using a buddy pass, when you are in your friend's game, you get to play together, but you don't retain, if you leave to go play with somebody else, you don't retain your progress. And I think that that's just worth noting for people who are using mm -hmm. the buddy pass system. I do like that they have it. So if you play with this one person, you play it all the way through together. You can. They they will retain their progress with you only. Um, yep. Just a little That's clarification. That's how we're playing it. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to the comparisons, to me, this just feels like a traditional RPG in that sense. It does not feel like Destiny. And I don't want to get down a rabbit hole comparing Destiny to Wolfenstein because I just think it's a bad comparison. Destiny is a shared world shooter and it has a whole other slew of features that don't match up. This just feels like there's a base. You go out on a mission, you come back to the base, you talk to people, you upgrade. You go out on a mission, you come back to the base, you talk to people, you upgrade. I mean, there's a there's a, a multitude of RPGs you could compare this to. Yeah. What I think is weird is that it's a first-person shooter, and it's been a linear, story-driven first-person shooter, and Machine Games has been very excellent at that. And so why they chose this path, I'm not sure. The frustrating part this timer is referring to in our traversal 
is that there is not a lot of direction in the level design about where you're supposed to go. And to make matters worse, there's no map. You only have a mini map and you can barely see what's happening. And as anybody who's ever used a mini map, which I'm going to go out on a limb and guess is everybody listening to this podcast. Um, if you see a marker on the edge of your mini map, you always go to your big map to go, is this marker really close or is it super far away? And I just think it's close because it's on the very edge of the mini map. But there's no big map in Wolfenstein Youngblood. And that I don't to me is a puzzling choice. Same. I said this last week, too, and someone in the YouTube comments said that if you hold still, the map apparently expands. I haven't tested it to find out, but either way, it's wild that there's not a button that you can press to just, like, pop up your big map. Yeah, no, it's like, nice. stand still? I stood still for a long time. It didn't get any it oh. didn't get any bigger but <laughs> like <laughs> even if it but oh. i don't know maybe it does but I even if it gets bigger that's a poor design choice like you can't have the idea of having like an open world traversal system even if they're open instances and not a true open world and not not providing a map particularly with the verticality that we find in wolfenstein youngblood like there was a section where Steimer and I were running up and down between three or four levels, trying to figure out where the marker was so that we could progress to the next section. And it's just such a monumental waste of time. Why make your players run around and look for an objective just for the sake of having them run around, especially since you're gonna to have to revisit these locations several times for all of the missions you're going to do. It just seemed like such a head scratcher of a choice. And it does actively contribute to a frustration while we're playing. And so that part of it was was irritating. And like it makes me kind of not want to finish the game, which I'm sad about. Um, but I also want to mention the things that I like about Youngblood, which is I like that they have these two female characters. I like that they're super powerful. I don't really like how we went in the prologue from them being like being trained by their parents you know bj and anna and then they're feeling really confident and then they have this nice little beat where they're like having imposter syndrome of going can we do this can we actually go out there and kill nazis i'm unsure of myself i've never done this and then bam they're instantly like badass nazi killers i just kind of wish that that story beat had never been there to be like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm doubting myself because it feels so futile in a world where these are hyper powered, you know, women that are the the daughters of this power couple in these amazing power suits with these crazy powerful guns. It just feels like, you know, it's leaning into what Wolfenstein is all about, which is like this running gun, hyper action first person shooter. It just, it just felt like at odds to me that they would take this moment to be like, yeah, but they're weak girls that had trouble shooting animals on a hunting trip, but now they're killing all these Nazis without thinking twice about it. I'm like, it just feels false. Yeah, it's and I, this goes back to what I was also saying last week is I think I had, it's all about expectations, right? And I think knowing that this is a cheaper game, they're offering a buddy pass with it, and this isn't going to be that solid I mean, I love Wolfenstein the New Colossus. It was an awesome game, and I thought the pacing was great. I liked the the story. I liked the way it went. Even when you went back to the central hub, you know, the character, same sort of thing. Like, you go back, you talk to characters, but it all felt so well planned out and so well orchestrated that you could just spend hours in there just wandering around and talking and finding new things to do. But, yeah, I, I hear you. Like, this, I really like Wolfenstein Youngblood as well. I mean, I like it in the sense that it's, it's, it's a fun shooter. It's a fun with some RPG mechanics. It's fun to hop in there and walk around and shoot some shit and explore a little bit, but I'm not champing at the bit to hop back in. It doesn't have that same draw that um, New Colossus had, and that was my first Wolfenstein game. So that's the only one I have to compare to. And I think that's kind of what has saved me from the disappointment, if you will, is just knowing that this isn't going to be that next game, but knowing what Machine Games is so capable of, it is also still kind of a head scratcher. Like, is this just a filler game? If so, that's a little obvious, but it's still fun. I don't know. I think this is, I mean, this is definitely an experiment for them to test building more. Op I, I hate calling it open world because it's not really open world, but I guess just larger, more flexible maps um, instead of the kind of more traditional linear ones that they've built. 
But I do think that they have a lot that they need to work on in terms of flagging things for players and, and letting people have visual indicators on the map of like where something is or is not traversable. Um, they have some, but like there was definitely way more moments where Andrea and I were just, uh, like she said, r- running around being confused yeah. than we were about playing the game. And I think the bummer about that is they have a lot of like really interesting things that they've spread out in the maps that might be fun to go back and and redo those levels for. So like you may have to go back to an area multiple, multiple times. And there's okay. like three main ones. Um, and one of the things that they have in there is like you find floppy disks, you decode them like, ooh, then you have to like try and go find where these stashes are. I'm like, this is cool in theory. But the fact that Andrea and I have spent 20 minutes trying to figure out where the main objective is right now means we're probably never going to find any of this shit. Like, because we're tired, we're tired by the time like we would want to get to the fun hunt down the thing because we're busy hunting down the main thing instead of just like, here's the main thing on a platter. It took us so long to find, like I could see the main objective down below us, but I was like, I have no idea how to get there. How do yeah. we get there? And like, it t- that was what we were like, Oh my God. Like, that's my biggest pet. One of my biggest pet peeves. It's like, well, how the hell do I do this? Just please, like, make my <laughs> life easier. I don't want to figure it out. But yeah, I agree. I, you know, I've been. We'll talk about Fire Emblem in a minute. But I haven't really had a draw to go back and play Wolfenstein Young Blood. But I can't help but wonder. I feel because I think about it. I'm like, okay, I have like five or six side quests I have to do, which I know are all going to take me back to the same place. I really have no interest or desire in doing those things. But I feel like I should do them to experience the side stories. If this was just a much more linear like game where you just move forward, move forward, move forward, I th- with a co- cohesive story, I feel like it'd be much more enticed to like go back and just experience it. But right now, it's like there's too much fluff, and I don't. No, I one hundred percent agree. If this was a more linear Wolfenstein, and in, in the way that the first few levels are, mm-hmm. I would be like Andrea. When are we playing again? Like, let's go through and and finish this. But I think another thing that I mentioned last night when we were playing is like, it also because it is. Um, structured the way it is, I feel like the story isn't as interesting or I want, like it leaves me wanting because I don't, I'm like, what are we even doing? Like, I don't know. We're like finding a briefcase because reasons, like, I'm not sure. I like, I know that the main purpose of the story is to find your dad, but I don't know how anything we're doing at this, like once you get into it a little bit, I'm like, I feel like I've lost the purpose, the main purpose, the main drive of the game. And that to me was a bummer. Cause like what I wanted was more of the first chunk of the game Yeah. where Andrea and I are like going through levels and like trying to take down dudes. And we're feeling like we're invested in this story and we're invested in these characters. And like, and I felt like I lost that the minute it tried to, yeah. Go a little more art. Not even the RPG problem. It's the map no, problem. It's the map. Yeah. It's the revisiting the levels, all the site. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. Exactly. And the, the idea of like the daily and weekly quests, like that was an odd choice of of like grindiness for and for and for what? Like I was like, why would I want to come back to this? It's so frustrating. And like the 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 element of the almost like Metroidvania stuff that was introduced off the get-go like how we got blocked from going to certain doors because it was like requires you know the laser work item or yeah. requires the like the electro work or these these and then here are some um you know undiscovered ammunition type it's like yeah this is it's you're weird. introducing these elements way too early in the game it makes me you know disheartened that i have to come all the way back to the beginning levels once I get some kind of gun further down the way and like for what? And I think about the stashes and I'm like, what's going to be in that stash besides like a pile of silver coins that I really want, you know, to upgrade the guns and and obviously like more guns and other things like that. But they didn't do a good enough job of like kerneling out, like dropping the breadcrumbs along the path to go, you're going to want to keep chasing this path because this is what you get. This is what you get. There's two guns. Well, I guess technically there's one gun um, in my upgrade list that I'm not even using because at the start of the game, you choose if you want like the pistol or the machine pistol. And I chose the traditional pistol and I was like, I'm never going to pay to upgrade the machine pistol because I don't, I don't play with it, but it's still there mm-hmm. in my menu and you can spend coins on it and then never use it. It's, 
it's, it feels like it had so much promise. And I was very excited about this game after Steimer and I had so much fun playing it at Judges Week, you know, back at pre E3. And now that it's here and we, we played up until like level 20 almost. Um, yeah. So like a decent, a decent chunk of the game. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of like a, what? why did you it's make a bit this of a, choice? Bit, yeah. <laughs> bit of a head scratcher. And I, I think this is a, to me, it's funny to me. I don't know where I'm trying to, I'm trying to like backtrack to it to the last week. Yeah. Because last week everyone was up in arms about these micros and micro transactions and being misinformed about them. And I saw a few things on my Twitter of like, well, you know, like this game has problems, blah, blah, blah. And I want to be here to say, yeah. And Andrea and I can sit here and acknowledge that this game has problems and also say you shouldn't be up in arms about these bullshit microtransactions, which are not the worst problem in this game. No, like, the <laughs> microtransactions are like cosmetic related. The boosters they took out of the game. If you want to buy boosters, cool. This game has a ton of problems, as Steimer just said. But none of them are that, microtransaction like, related. <laughs> like those boosters, like I already feel like we leveled really fast. We leveled super fast, yeah. Yeah, so I was like, is this even, why would that, I'm glad they took it out because I feel like it wouldn't have even been necessary. It would have felt really weird. Exactly. Um, and but that was the other thing I thought was also strange. I was like, am I just out leveling a lot of the shit already? I don't know. It felt, it feels imbalanced in a lot of it's, ways. I was worried with this game launch that having the title Wolfenstein on it would hinder everything about it. And I hate saying that because I don't want to sound over dramatic or anything. I understand why Wolfenstein's in the title. But you, when you think of the Wolfenstein titles, I mean, like I said, New, New Colossus is my first Wolfenstein game, but I fucking loved it. I loved it so much. And this doesn't feel like that. You know, obviously there's Nazis and you shoot shit and the gunplay feels real great. But other than that, it's just a little, eh. Is this, I still stand by what I said last week. It's still fun. You know, Jason, and I like to grab a drink and just like sit down and play it and shoot some shit and like laugh and giggle, whatever. We're little schoolgirls. We giggle and we laugh. We have a good time shooting, shooting things. But it's just, it's not that narrative experience that wolf that i know to be with wolfenstein i guess even no, though i've only played a, one game that's a great way totally. of putting it it's not the experience that machine games has set you up to expect from the reboot of wolfenstein but it is it's fast it's fluid the gunplay is great the bullets feel great shooting nazis feels good the traversal is super fun in the power suit being able to double jump and get up to these places like like it feels fun it just feels repetitive and badly managed from a navigation standpoint when it comes to level design and yep. that makes it not as fun to play and that's a bummer agree yeah there was even one point where we thought we were in the right place and for we that worked. one mission remember and we were and like we kept <laughs> going basically we like went in and out of this loading screen section off like constantly because we were like wait is it inside this thing is it outside this thing where is no it map. How do you not have a fucking map in your game? And so then we eventually realized we're not even in the right, right section of the map because, like, there's three zones, basically, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the beginning two areas. And uh, we were in the wrong one of those. But, like, there was no real... We were super confused. It was not to yeah. declare. Um, so that was a bummer. But I do think that even despite, like, the navigation issues, which are a problem... I really feel like for me, the thing that kind of killed my motivation the fastest was the respawning. It just, you know, drove, it just had... drove me up a wall. I was like, are you serious? These fucking guys are back. That's so, so like, weird. Maybe I haven't had. The... Are you playing on casual? Is it like a normal no. thing? No, we're playing on normal, but oh, maybe it's just by game. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, that's yeah. When you guys mentioned the respawning, I was like, I don't know if I've even, huh? Like it's never popped up in my head, but I'll be paying attention now and I'll let you know. Yeah, there were times when I screamed because I wasn't expecting there to be a dude and I ran face <laughs> first to someone. I was like, I'm sorry, Andrea, but I was just startled. I didn't think that there would be a man here, and there is. Um, yeah, there, was a, there was a couple moments uh, of screaming yeah. from Steimer, which I liked. Yeah. It was fun. I was surprised. I was caught off guard. Let's but talk yeah. about Fire Emblem. Okay, oh ladies, we've talked about Wolfenstein <sighs> long enough. So this conversation will be spoiler free. Obviously, neither one of us have beaten the game. But from my understanding, Steimer and I are about one chapter apart, and she has experienced stuff where things have gone down, and I am not yet at that point. You are about to get there. I'm about to get there. 
I had a feeling. Anyway, I this game this game I had no idea that this was going to happen to me. It is consuming my life. I'm ignoring my husband. I'm ignoring my <sighs> dog. I'm ignoring my hygiene. I'm ignoring everything and anything. I'm still eating a lot, which is great. But I just like I I can't stop playing it. I just I'm up till two or three in the morning, almost every morning playing it. I'm waking up at like eight dead. I am so taken over by this, and I think it's that stupid. I don't know what you call this. The persona type, the persona type management that's incorporated into this, you know, where you have your battles, which I think the battles are so fun as they are. Like, I love them. But then in between that you have, okay, like, let's go talk to people. Let's go strategize, like making friends with them. Who do you want to bang? We find these items, deliver them to people. How do you want to train people? Do you want to have a seminar? Do you, I can't get yeah, enough. There's a lot. I mean, to, let's back up a little bit. If you've no, never played a I'm fire emblem, gushing. if you've never played a fire emblem, so I'm like trying to like, just different. Give, you, you just rambled off. A lot I know, of stuff. but I'm, so I'm, I'm like, I'm a bubble trying to... bottle of emotions and I need to get it all out <laughs> okay fair enough fair enough but if someone has no idea because like talk, so here's I the talked thing. about it last week people know so they don't fucking know That's they don't know about the fire listen. emblems who cares um, you don't have time to recap what this game is because i talked about it last week just hop into it girl let's do this god damn all right uh anyways so i have to agree with Brittany. this oh. is i've played like 40 hours of this game which yeah. this is my favorite game of the year so far this is the one game that I want to play all the time. When I'm at work, I'm thinking about going home and playing this game. And I'm just like, and I even, I bring it with me and like sit it on my desk and I never get to play it because I'm working, but I just like having it near me. And so like, maybe, maybe someone will stop talking to me and I won't have a meeting and I'll be able to play for a few minutes. Um, that never happens, but it's my wishful thinking that keeps it near me at all times. Because, and I'm constantly like this. I've played so much of my switch. This is the most I've ever played my switch. This bad boy is constantly with me or on its charger. Like I, I'm like head over heels for this game. I love this fucking game. No. And like Brittany said, it is, I think part of it is due to the fact that it's similar to persona in a lot of ways. Um, you have to like manage your time when you're at the monastery with the classes and figuring out how you're going to build out your squad. Um, because you can have lots of people built different ways. Like you can have a mage who's super built on healing or a really damage based or a mix of both, or you can have, somebody who wants to be like a cavalier or a holy knight or something. And then you need to like, make sure you're leveling up those things to get to that place. You can recruit people from other classes because you, at the beginning of the game, it's called three houses. Spoiler alert. Uh, you <laughs> pick one, you pick one of those houses. Um, and then you can, some of the people from other classes are still available to you. I recruited Sylvain from the blue lions. I thought oh. he was golden deer because he's so horny and that's the horny yeah. class is golden deer yeah, they yeah. are all about banging but um i went black eagles because they looked super cool i would say two two people in the golden deer are very uh very after it and another one's just a tease but no sylvain is my number two husbando sylvain is the best he's pretty great he's so cute oh uh, so cute uh, um okay so, i'm gonna google yeah, this so dude like, now so like there's <laughs> There's so many elements to this game that I like, and I do love the battles as well. Yes, uh, because so like they're really satisfying, and Ooh, they're all ginger. Sort of yeah, like, ginger boy, he cute. Um, but still, like even though I love this game so much, I know, for instance, Andrea would not like this game. Oh no, this is Andrea's worst nightmare. This is why when Nintendo game. emailed me and said, "Would you like a code for Fire Emblem's Three Houses?" I was like, "Yo, Steimer, <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo has called. It's and your it moment." <laughs> and I, I literally was like, "Okay, sure, I guess we'll take it." Like I had zero expectations, which I think is part of why I love this so so much. Yeah, because I literally was just like, "All right, I got, like for the show, I should like turn this game on and play it a little bit." And then I was like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> It's got me. It's got it me. Got you guys. Got me. I'm in it. I'm in it. I want to play this game for the rest of my fucking life. It's so oh, no. I look at my counter and I'm like, I'm 40 hours into this. I'm like, I hope it doesn't end soon. Like that's yeah. my train you know, of thought, right? I got, I got like a little. I was like, I did the thing. You've done this before, Brittany. I'm sure. Where like you get to that turning point and you kind of just go back and replay it a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, because you're like, what well, do I want it? What if it's soon? What if it's over soon? I don't want it to be over soon. I see. Yeah. 
Let's keep going back. Oh, I did that. Um, but now I've decided, no, no, I am, I'm moving forward. So like I, I'm continuing to progress in the story. Um, but God, like there's just so many really lovely things about it. I love the way the other characters interact with each other. So I love learning to see, I like seeing their stories. I like seeing those characters grow. There's just a lot of, and like again, and like, and the battle system's fucking great. So like, you really get the chance to sit there and strategize about what types of units you want on your field and how you want to play. And like, do you want to build a line of fucking knights with armor that are just protecting all of these mages yes. that are gonna blast everybody? Or do you want a bunch of archers sniping? Or do you just want like a couple archers? And most, like, I have mostly uh, real big boys who just like take shit out. I have like two cavaliers, no paladins. Sorry. Uh, and Sylvain is one, and Fer- Fernand is the other. Yeah, Fernand, I was, I was ready to kick Fernand to the fucking sky yeah. because he was pissing me off in the beginning. He was not leveling as fast as everybody else. He was like three to four, up to five at one point levels behind everyone else. And I was like, my dude, what is going on? Why don't you want XP? XP is your friend. Take it. I'm literally offering you kills. Take it. Um, so <laughs> let me stop you for a second. Okay. Because this is all incredibly confusing to people like me oh, who are I'm like, sure. what yeah. the heck are you even talking about? Um, so I did t- speak to, to Tim about Fire Emblem a couple of weeks back um, before the game came out when he had gotten like an advanced copy even before our copies came in. And he was trying to explain to me how this Fire Emblem is different than other Fire Emblems. Um, so maybe for people like me who are like, oh my God, these two are so excited about this game. I feel like... I should maybe learn about this game or go figure out if I want to play this game. Can you explain how the battle system works and why it's different for this Fire Emblem than previous ones? I have not played any other Fire Emblem, so I can't speak to differences. I can explain what it is. So yeah. basically, real, but, real quick, Brittany, I'll have just, you? Yeah, I've played other Fire okay, Emblems. Cool. Um, what I will say is that I've spent maybe like 10 to 15 hours, maybe even more than that, actually, in the past two Fire Emblem games on... Um, the DS handheld systems. Uh, But I was able to pick up the battle system in Fire Emblem Three Houses, no problem. It's exactly, there might be some minor tweaks that I might just have forgotten about, but it feels essentially the same. I say the biggest change comes when you're not battling, when you're off the battlefield. Okay. And the battle is like a, like a grid based top down grid based, like a chessboard, but more like like XCOM (laughs) kind of right. (laughs) Kind of, yeah. So, like, yeah, each movement or each unit has a number of specified movement it can have per turn. Um, it's turn-based, so you would hate it, Andrea. Um, and <laughs> So it's like Mario like certain, plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. Kind of, there yeah. There you go. Certain, there you certain, go. Units, certain units have more movement than others, i.e. if you are mounted on horseback, you can move, attack, and then move back, or you can, like, move to, you have, like, extra move units, basically. Um, Or if you're flying, like, certain terrain, like, because there's terrain on the ground, too, that will impact, um, either it will give you, like, greater defense, or, oh, my God, there's certain sand pits that, like, slow you down. Oh, the horses are the worst. Oh, so much. It slows you down, and then you're just like, I want to die because I can't You you can only move one square per turn, and that really sucks. it's real slow. Um, so, yeah, you're usually taking out people. There are beasts eventually that come about where basically um, you have to use what's called a gambit. So, like, you can assign battalions to your units. So, if I am main character, I can have a battalion of, like, 70 dudes that will attack on my command. And that command is called a gambit. I think that's roughly what it is. I don't actually... Sure. Anyways, you go up near to the enemy, where however close you need to be. If they're archers, you can be a little bit farther back. If they are melee, they need to be. You need to be like on the square right up next to them. Um, and then you can initiate a gambit. If there's other people nearby, your gambit is boosted by them. Uh, so like, there's a lot of different elements and strategy in it, especially yeah, when yeah. you're down strategy, to like, right? Like that's the crux of the combat, right? Totally. Like so, for instance, Sylvain, who has a trait. I forget what it's called. It's like philanderer or something. And so you want him always near women. Like you want him near female troops because it gives him a bonus. So like there's so good. funny things like that where you have to pay attention to your troops on the battlefield. Who is there? Also, if you as the main character are looking to romance someone, you typically want to keep them near you on the battlefield um, because anytime you base you kill something or attack something near another unit, 
um, there like will be a little heart that goes up. It's like, Bloop. I liked that. Thanks for killing the thing. <laughs> <laughs> And You're after so enough strong. Hearts. I love you so much. <laughs> and just like that, that's how we make love in this game. Yeah, yes. but after enough of that, then like like Samer said, the little hearts fills up the little um, friendship meter that you have with people. It starts with like uh, D C, B, A, and then S rank, I think is the top one you can yeah, get. S rank is when you get to marry them finally. Oh. But anyway. Uh, yeah, so, in the, so I'm usually not one for turn-based tactic, you know, whatever like this. That's usually not my jam. I mean, I love turn-based RPGs, but not the grid-based stuff. Uh, that said, you know, it's incredibly fun. It's very easy to pick up. There are, you know, a lot of little nooks and crannies of the game in terms of mechanics that I think, like, don't click until much later. Because you're like, oh, because there's so much to kind of take in if this is your first Fire Emblem game. I don't, I can't say whether or not it's a little overwhelming. Simer, did you find it to be that way at all? It was different. Like the support thing was something that I got later on at the beginning. I wasn't really thinking about who was going next to who and mm. yeah, where they needed to be on the battlefield and all that kind of shit. I was just like, I kill people. They level yeah. up. Great. Um, but it is important later. And it is fun to see when other characters on the battlefield like raise their support levels and then you get the fun little cutscenes between those two oh. characters and you get to see what's going on with them and how their relationships develop so that um is like it's just super fun to see and i really like the i'm not, obviously we said we're keeping it spoiler free but i do really like the main arc mm -hmm. um and i think that that is also oh, yeah. really interesting and satisfying Twists so and turns galore man last night at 2 a.m so i was gasping clutching my pearls by myself in our little theater room. But no, it's really good. And something else I just want to go back to the uh, the battle system is that, you know, if you're a turn-based RPG fan, you you can grind in this game and you can oh, get Oh, I OP. do. I overgrind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's really nice to do those story missions where you're like five or ten levels higher and you're like, ha-ha, oh you my god, got nothing on me. Dude, oh. Caspar is a fucking beast. So Caspar is this little blue-haired guy and he like is really over-eager about, Rah, I'm going to train and everything. It's kind of annoying. He's great. I love him. And See, I don't like, this is the interesting thing. He's you know just him. like I do, yeah. He's in your he's in your class, but I'm just now like C rank with him because he's not in my class. So if I want to raise that rank with him, I either have to recruit him by buffing my stats that he's attracted to or like mm -hmm. inviting him to a million dinners and then he'll be Yeah. Like, yeah. So that's <laughs> another like that's another element of the game is when you're <laughs> I mean, at listen, the if someone invited me to a million dinners, I would probably like them a little bit more than I would if they didn't invite me to dinner too. <laughs> Fair so, enough. like, it makes sense. I get it. So you have your ranks between your relationships with people. You have your ranks in terms of skills. You have your character traits, which level up when you level up, and random numbers will basically be assigned. Or if you get specific items that will boost strength by two or whatever, you can consume those. You also have a professor rank. So the professor rank only really goes up if you do specific things at the school on your days off. Um, so you can do things like fish. You can gar always garden. If you are oh starting, God, this, yeah. if you are starting this game and have never uh, need a tip garden, garden every time you can put as many seeds as you can cultivate that shit. And oh, like, yeah. you'll be good to shit. go. Cause it's, that gives you so much XP. Yeah. Um, and then you can do things like eventually things like a choir will unlock. You can do that. There are notes. Like there's all these little things that you'll want to do in order to gain the professor XP. Cause the more, the higher your professor level means the more things you can do in that amount of time uh, and like be raising these ranks between your classmates or between people who aren't in your class, like other um, professors or whatever. Like there's other people at the school too, that you can have relationships with. Uh, and so it's all really, really neat. And like, super super addictive the other thing that's traditional fire emblem that i opted out of oh God, um, the is the permadeath Fuck that so shit. in the, uh, one of the things about fire emblem games is the fact that like a unit falls in battle and they die like they are supposed to die forever that's part of the consequence but you can turn that off in this game i turned it off uh because fuck that shit <laughs> 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 but i want video game happy times i don't want to fucking stress out and have to redo a whole battle because I mismanaged well, one mage. Whoops. Yeah, and I think that comes to, you know, we talked about this last week, that the production and these characters are so well thought out and so well built that I don't even know how many characters are in this game. There has to be a, a metric butt ton. But each single one seems so well thought out, so well planned, and the voice acting is so great. And they, 
it's not like they're just hollow husks of NPCs, right? They're, they're legitimate, like, humans with their own struggles going through their own problems, and you get to see that unfold, and it's fascinating to watch them interact. I'll have a character interaction between two characters who are polar opposite. I'm like, oh, grab my popcorn. This is going to be good. You know, like, watching to see how they're going to interact with each other, right? And it's to me, that's the highlight of this game, and it's so well done. And I am just so thrilled that... This is going to sound bad. I love my 3DS, but I'm so happy it's dying because it's making these games that were primarily on these handheld systems now onto the Switch, which is obviously much more powerful, and that these games can finally evolve and grow. And speaking of evolving, kind of like with Pokemon Sword and Shield, right? I don't think this game is going to be the, the definitive, like, oh, my God, the best Pokemon game ever. But I think it's a step in the direction that we ultimately want the series to go in. And so I think... Fire Emblem coming to the Switch is the best thing for the franchise. And I am just, oh my God, I love it so much. Dude, and it's so fun to see. I mean, at work, I work with a lot of gamers and like everyone is playing and it's really fun to be like, oh my God, are you playing it? Okay, how far are you? I don't want to spoil anything. You know, like, and just having these discussions with other people has been so nice. Um, because and like I want to talk with you, Brittany, but like obviously not right here, because people are watching. But it's uh it's really, it's a delightful game. If you do enjoy strategy games, Japanese role-playing games, if you like Persona in any way, um, I just think just a good story. Like game. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's, I, like, I don't want to be recording this anymore. I want to play this game. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's what I tweeted tweet last week. I said the best thing about having besties in this industry is I can tell you guys and be brutally honest. Like, I love you, but I'd rather be playing Fire Emblem. And you both are like, all right, cool. Go on with your bad self. No that's, more feeling. That's going to be me soon. That's going to be me when Borderlands comes out, when when Forsaken comes out. It's me right now wanting to play play Destiny Solstice event and being like, no, no, go play Wolfenstein with Steimer. <laughs> play something yeah. besides Lego Tower for once, you coward. <laughs> um, I have been playing Sky from that game company but I haven't played enough of it yet uh, so I'll save that for next week and hopefully I'll be able to finish it it's not a very long game I just um, have only been playing it in spurts but uh, thanks for that in-depth report ladies uh, oh. so if that doesn't get you hype for Fire Emblem I don't know what does <laughs> so That's how about bad. we all take a break and go play some Fire Emblem I mean I'm going to go play Destiny uh, actually I mean, <laughs> I'm going to respond to some emails because work is a thing um, but We want to thank you guys for stopping by What's a Good Games. Don't forget, we have a lot of cool stuff happening at the end of the month. And if you want to help support everything we do here, patreon.com slash what's good games is a perfect place to do it. Even if it's just a couple of bucks, every little bit helps. And we appreciate all of the support that you guys give us. So hopefully you guys are having a fantastic summer playing games of your choice and uh, just kind of loving life. We're getting to that point where summer's going to be done before you know it. But until then, we're going to suck the last drops of life out of it. Ooh, that's what she said. Ooh, but... very vampiric. Whoa. I like it. Whoa. Oh, whoa. All right, bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Have a great week.